Thank you, Mike. Uh, just wanted to say hi to everybody in the EM family. This is our in-service prep 2024. Uh, this should help with both the in-training exam and for the American Board of Emergency Medicine uh, written boards. I wanted to just kind of shout out um, Joe Lex. He is the person who was the AAEM educational, domestic and international uh, educational leader for years and years. Happened to be my roommate and he gifted me these slides. And so today we're going to go through the slides. It's a lot. Um, and it should be a review of the entirety of emergency medicine. Is it, a, is it an entire review to a specific detail? No, of course not. But it's some of the high yield points. So we hope to bring that to you. And you'll be hearing from many of us in the program leadership. So we're excited to share this with you. So let's begin. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the test itself. So some of these numbers may have shifted um, as years, and I'm not sure about the most recent version but approximately for the in-training exam, you'll see about 225 questions that you'll be asked to do in about four and a half hours. When you get to the written boards itself, it'll be around 300 questions in six plus hours. Importantly, the distribution is about 15% pictorial, 75% required to pass. And the pass rate has varied over time, but it's been approximately around 90% for first time test takers. Questions tend to be a little bit more oriented towards pathophysiology, but there are a lot of case-based, and just remember it's emergency medicine, so it's very action-oriented. Here are some of the core content areas. You'll notice that signs and symptoms, abdominal and GI, cardiovascular represent a high amount. So it's important to know that these sections will be more, uh, more represented in the exam as opposed to some of these other sections. So continuing on, you'll also see that respiratory and trauma, as I continue here, will be also more highly represented. But it's important that there are procedures and skills. Remember that you do need to know some other components as well. All right, now just some test taking strategy. About one minute per question. The pictorials may take longer, but as we talked about in our test taking strategies talk before, you may be able to answer these questions even without seeing the pictures. You should answer each question as you go. There are opportunities to mark questions if you want to reconsider. Um, now, a couple more strategy points. If you anticipate the answer as you read the question, you're probably right. And just remember that there are questions that aren't scored. So they have experimental questions because they're trying to come up with the perfect semantic way of phrasing a question. So it's important that, you know, if you, something seems poorly worded or confusing, it may just be one of those experimental questions. Don't let it throw you off. And um, when I'm saying right on the computer, basically what I'm saying is that there are ways you can kind of like highlight and underline and different things now that it's on, on the computer. Um, so just make sure you don't overdo that because I might have done that when I was taking the real boards and um, found myself at one point just a little short on time. So then I had to abandon that and uh, kind of move forward. All right, three types of questions. Uh, you either know the answer, you know, part of the answer or you have no idea what they're talking about. It's okay. It's the in-training exam for right now and we'll see you next week and we'll be there to support you. But just realize that if you don't know it right now, it's okay. You will have an opportunity to learn every version, permutation, combination of all the different types of questions that they will ask. And you know this, answers which usually say always or never, usually not correct. Two answers are close, one's probably correct. Two answers are directly opposite, one probably is correct. And if an answer doesn't read well, it's probably wrong. Or if it happens to be too wordy, it's probably wrong. Picture questions. Um, like I said, you probably won't even need the pictorial to be able to answer the question. And the two questions that I ask myself just as the best test taking strategy is one, who is the patient? So demographically, is it a child? Is it an adult? Um, is it somebody from a specific area of the world? Um, and then the second question I ask myself, what would they want me to know? And so, you know, the example that I've given before is if I show you a child's x-ray with pneumonia, you know, what are the types of children that might get pneumonia frequently? And so in that case, it might be a child or a patient who has cystic fibrosis, okay? Relax. Uh, you know, you got incredible training here, you're gonna do fine. So let's get into it. Let's start with abdominal and GI. And um, yep, uh, you know, this is the way we felt a little bit about, about COVID over the years. So, all right, let's talk about sudden causes of pain in the abdominal GI system. All right, these are the ones that you should highlight. One, mesenteric embolus leading to ischemia or infarction, right? So when we talk about MI here, we're talking about mesenteric ischemia. A ruptured AAA. If they give you the stem that it's a patient who is uh, 
over 50 who has radiating pain to their back, they are not asking you or they're not talking about a kidney stone. They're wanting you to focus on a ruptured AAA, okay? And that's really, really important. Um, and also maybe they might have something here where if you have an aortic disease or dissection, that it will be some sort of chest pain, abdominal pain, back pain with some neurologic complaint. Another perforated viscous. Um, renal colic is sudden, but probably not one of the emergencies they'll focus on. And then remember, sequel volvulus also. So we kind of laughingly talk about these are the things that not snap, crackle, pop, but these are the things that probably um, that pop right? So these are things that either pop, block, or tear. So remember that pop, block, or tear for truly sudden causes of abdominal pain, especially those that are emergency causes. All right, lethal causes. Muscimia, uh, mesenteric ischemia, like we've talked about, ruptured AAA, perforated viscous. And then don't forget that, you know, an inferior MI, if it's epigastric, that can be one of the causes. All right, think of these entities first as your lethal causes. All right, this will be really important on the test. Let's focus a little bit deeper. Gastrointestinal bleeding. These are important causes to remember. Diverticulosis, the most common cause of massive lower GI bleeding. Let me repeat that. Diverticulosis, most common cause of massive lower GI bleeding. It's painless. Mesenteric infarction. So there'll be an associated abrupt onset of pain, lower GI bleeding. They'll probably have a positive lactate on the exam is one of the findings that they'll add to that for you. If there's an aortic enteric fistula with an upper GI bleed or lower GI bleed, just remember that it might be in a patient with a history of AAA repair. Um, possibly it could be a child if, if the stem is a pediatric one and if there's some massive upper GI bleeding, think about a button battery that could have potentially gotten in, perforated, created a tract, and now you have this upper GI bleed. Diarrhea, right? If it is mucoid and bloody, plus a high fever, plus a febrile seizure in an infant, think Shigella. If it's diarrhea in a patient with a pet turtle or an iguana, think Salmonella. If it's diarrhea in a patient without a spleen or with sickle cell disease, think Salmonella. If it's diarrhea and pseudoappendicitis, think about Yersinia pestis. Diarrhea and fecal white blood cells after poultry or eggs, think Salmonella or Campylobacter. If it's diarrhea after poultry or meat, but no fecal white blood cells, think about Clostridium perfringens. If it's diarrhea that's profuse and watery after antibiotics, think about C. diff. If it's diarrhea after potato salad or mayonnaise, think about Staph aureus. Diarrhea after fried rice, be serious. Diarrhea after raw oysters, Vibrio cholera. Diarrhea after drinking from mountain streams, think about Giardia. Diarrhea in an AIDS patient, Think about isosporidium or cryptosporidium. Diarrhea and hemolytic uremic syndrome in kids or TTP in adults. Think about E. coli 01577. Diarrhea two to four hours after eating staph. Sorry, diarrhea, diarrhea two to four hours after eating. Think about staph. Um, mostly the person will have vomiting, but they can have diarrhea as well. Um, also think about being serious. Others will typically take longer. And then if we talk about traveler's diarrhea, think about generally enterotoxigenic E. coli in about approximately 50%. And just as an aside, some daily prophylactic antibiotic prevents about 90% of this if you have a person who's traveling. So don't, it may not be uncommon for a patient to be on an antibiotic while they're traveling internationally. And of course we do know that that could potentially lead to a C. diff infection, uh, particularly if they're taking a uh, fluoroquinolone. Uh, or, or if for some reason uh, you have a dental patient who might um, be, uh, you know, taking an antibiotic, either penicillin or um, an, under the, on any other type of antibiotic. Diarrhea plus pseudomembranous colitis. Think about C. diff. Remember recent antibiotic use. Um, now we're starting to shift some of the treatment here from oral metronidazole. Um, vancomycin is now coming a little bit more in favor. Um, think about that for severe infections. Okay, shifting, GI, foreign bodies, is it safe? Okay, that's one of the ways to think about this. Um, now, this is not always the case, but this is if you have a coin in your either airway or esophagus, there may be a question that asks you, where is this foreign body located? Now, if the patient is choking, 
drooling, showing you airway signs, then you need to be thinking about airway. If they're thinking about vomiting, um, you should probably be thinking about esophagus. But that said, if you have a patient who has the coin um, on its side in the AP projection, you can think about airway. Sorry. So, and then if you can see it on its face, meaning you can actually see like the head, then think about it in the esophagus, in the AP or PA projection. All right. So again, if the coin's on its side, all right, so it's be even thinner, like narrow, think about it as the airway. And I, I guess I think about it like, unfortunately, like a slot machine that you've got that uh, when you, you know, when you see the cords, you can kind of see it a little bit more narrow that the coin would kind of fit in on its side, you know, on the airway side and the AP projection. And then I guess when it comes down lower for the esophagus, you can see it. So then here's an example where you can see this on its face, right? In the AP projection. Now, of course, here very clearly you can see the airway is up here. So you know that it's not in the airway, but if for some reason you were able to get this side view, you can potentially see that the airway is coming down here and the esophagus is behind, all right? So for the esophagus, in the AP projection, it more, like, more likely to be on its face and then on its side in the, on the lateral, okay? For the trachea, you would most likely to see it here in its side, okay? And then on this portion here, you would more likely to see it on its face. Foreign bodies, most commonly in adults, think about food, especially meat impaction. In children, think about coins, also think about nuts. This idea of glucagon and an effervescent agent relieves the obstruction. Um, in real practice, that's not the case. That might be the first action that they might ask you to do in the board scenario. But I think those of us who've been practicing for a long time realize that this is usually not the best thing and retrieval is the best strategy. Remember, like I'd mentioned before, that a button battery can perforate. So they talk about getting this button battery out as fast as possible. Um, they're using a number here like six hours, but just as fast as possible. What's contraindicated is something like meat tenderizer. Now, talking about esophageal terror versus an esophageal rupture. So the patient stem here for Mallory Weiss would be vomiting, 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 and then some small flex or some small amounts of bleeding because there's a terror that happens, and then now you'll have those specs come out. If you have a full thickness tear, like a Borhoff syndrome, then that vomiting, vomiting, vomiting creates rupture, ultimately leading to mediastinitis. One of the classic patient stems might be a patient with alcohol use disorder who has vomiting and then ends up with chest pain. And then that chest pain then uh, on the x-ray, you might see a left pleural, pleural effusion. So some of the differential here might be a pulmonary embolus or aortic dissection, but don't forget about this. And so the stem might be a patient's been vomiting, 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 um, and then they sort of develop chest pain afterwards. And like I said, the patient might have an alcohol use disorder. Let's talk about caustic ingestions, all right? This is one that they love. It's like a darling on the boards. Alkali burns cause liquefaction necrosis. Acidic burns cause coagulation necrosis. If you have an oral burn, you must do an upper endoscopy. Steroids are controversial. For certain, what's contraindicated is the syrup of Ipecac, anything that's neutralizing. So if a patient has an alkali ingestion, you don't give a, an acid to it or vice versa. And watch out for an NG tubes in the particular uh, stem. So one of the choices might be place an NG tube to try to suck out. Um, you would not want to do that because potentially the tissue itself is friable and you'd be worried that the NG tube might perforate the tissue. Let's talk about the stomach and ulcer disease. So for duodenal ulcers, they're more common than gastric ulcers. So if the question is asking what's the most likely type of an ulcer, a duodenal ulcer would be more correct 80% over a gastric ulcer, which is 20%. Most common cause for ulcer disease is our bacteria H. pylori. The most common symptom that a patient might have would be pain. If it's within the gastric area, that might be postprandial pain. If it's in the duodenum, the pain might be relieved by a meal. And so those might be things that'll jump out to you in the question stem. Anterior perforation of an ulcer can cause peritonitis. Posterior perforation can cause either pancreatitis. And why this happens is bleeding may happen uh, from erosion into the posterior duodenal artery. 
upper GI bleed. So remember, we talked about in lower GI bleeds, diverticulosis being the most common. The most common cause for upper GI bleeds is peptic ulcer disease. Let me say that again. The most common cause for an upper GI bleed is peptic ulcer disease. More so than erosive gastritis, more so than varices, more so than Mallory Weiss, more so than esophagitis. 90% of erosive gastritis is alcohol related. And historically, and it still might be one of the risk, like answer questions, ice water lavage might be there. It's ineffective. Uh, endoscopy is what is ultimately needed. All right, let's move to biliary disease. All right, so this is when we're talking about a bilirubin that's between 2 to 2.5 that can lead clinically to a patient showing signs of jaundice. Remember, if it's prehepatic, pre then it's hemolytic. If it is hepatic, then it's hepatocellular. If it's post-hepatic, it's obstructive. Now, remember, there's a whole continuum from biliary colic to cholelithiasis, ultimately to cholecystitis, which is the infected hot gallbladder, right? A calculus cholecystitis is only about 5 to 10%, but they do like to put that on some of these test questions, just as I've seen over the years. There are a lot of findings that we have to try to find out if a patient has cholecystitis. And interestingly, I think as emergency medicine doctors, we're probably uniquely prepared because we're both clinically able to do it uh, with lots of sensitivity and we can perform our own ultrasound. So remember the Murphy sign, it's 97% sensitive, right? So this is pain when it asks the patient to take a deep breath in and it arrests their breathing when you palpate on inspiration. Gallstones, 94% sensitive, 78% specific, right? So if you have pericholecystic fluid, boom, you've got cholecystitis. If you have a gallbladder wall that's thickened, greater than three millimeters, boom, you know, you've got findings. We see the big stone there, you've got findings. So these are all things that we know will uh, cause a positive finding for either cholelithiasis or cholecystitis in the right clinical scenario. A HIDA scan can be 97% sensitive, 90% specific. Some of these numbers have adjusted over time. Do not forget triads. They love triads and pentads on the exam, but the Charcot triad, fever, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain. Remember that as ascending cholangitis. Let's shift to pancreatitis. Remember the top two causes for pancreatitis, gallstones and alcohol. They're approximately like neck and neck. And depending on whether you might be in an inner city population, you may see a little bit more higher rates of the alcohol. No diagnostic test is perfect, but lipase is for us the most useful. And then remember mild elevations of that lipase aren't really specific, but it is very specific if it's greater than five times the upper limit of normal. You may still see Rancid's criteria. This is still a good criteria that predicts mortality. And so you can see in this little slide here, you know, these are the admission ones. So for emergency medicine, these are the ones that we think about the most. And if you have two or more, that's really portends a bad future prognosis. Age greater than 55, white blood cell count greater than 16,000, glucose greater than 200, and LDH greater than 350, AST greater than 250. And so interestingly, you know, if you're seeing the test questions and they're giving you an LDH, and you're like, why are they giving me an LDH? Oh, I think about that sometimes with a patient with HIV. Just remember that it's also part of Ransom's criteria. So if you see that, you'll be like, oh, this patient has pancreatitis, and they're trying to make me see if this patient is going to be in trouble with that. Now, after those first 48 hours, there's the crit drop, the calcium going down, the base deficit, the UN going up, fluid sequestration, arterial PO2 going down. I haven't seen them ask about this because this tends to be the inpatient side, but this definitely seen them ask, the admissions criteria for Ransom's. Or small bowel obstruction, the most common cause of small bowel obstruction, adhesions from prior surgery. If the patient has never had surgery, then you think about hernia more so than the neoplasm. If the patient has a small bowel obstruction and they're less than two years old, think into susception. X-ray findings that you might have, they might talk about multiple air fluid levels and then dilated air fluid loops of small bowel. Peritonitis is a late finding for small bowel obstruction. So again, here you can see the nice small bowel, um, doesn't have the hostra that you see of the large bowel, and then you can kind of see the cutoffs here, right? Fluid at the bottom and then air on the top. And then also notice there's no air in the large bowel here, okay? You can, you know, and then they'd be able to, with a CT scan, be able to tell you the transition point. Intestinal ischemia, we talked about this as one of the emergencies. The most common cause for intestinal ischemia is arterial embolus and approximately 
Um, so think about this as the elder patient, history of atrial fibrillation, um, and usually tend to be a cardiovascular path. And then they end up with a sudden acute pain that's usually chest or belly. Um, most of the time it'll be belly and you'll end up with a lower GI bleeding and elevated lactate. Uh, arterial thrombus is approximately 15%. Venous thrombus is approximately 15%. What is non-occlusive vascular disease? This may be a hypotensive episode that the patient has. And so that's approximately 20%. So I want you to think about this as the most common being arterial embolus, okay? And then the second being a non-occlusive vascular disease where the patient has a hypo. So essentially that they have like atherosclerotic plaque that's located in these major vessels, whether it's the superior or lower or celiac, um, you're worried about those. And then the patient ends up with uh, a, some, a hypotensive episode that ends up not allowing for blood flow to those areas of the intestines. So that's the non-inclusive vascular disease. What would you find? Pain out of proportion, stool positive for blood, what's helpful, elevated serum lactate, and then marked leukocytosis. Typical x-ray and CT findings, a thickened bowel wall. Maybe they're gonna show you some sort of diagnostic with air within the bowel wall. So be on the lookout for pneumatosis intestinalis. Maybe you'll see air in the biliary system. The study of choice would be CT angio, as we know. However, in real practice, we know it can often be difficult um, for others, not for us, but we are considering this diagnosis and then the patient's creatinine might be elevated. And so that ends up causing a discussion just between you, the radiology person and the patient uh, for shared decision-making and for informed consent. All right, here's an example of just some of the circumferential wall thickening that you might see of the descending colon here. And then here, you can see the little bits of air for pneumatosis intestinalis. Um, here you can actually see some biliary tree uh, air. And then right here would be a large branch occlusion you can see of the SMA. Okay, so just as buzzwords, abdominal pain and AFib, abdominal pain and endocarditis, abdominal pain and recent large MI, abdominal pain and severe cardiomyopathy or a low EF, abdominal pain and the patients on DIG or vasopressors, we want you to think mesenteric ischemia. All right, diverticular disease, diverticulitis, left lower quadrant tenderness, distension, normal bowel sounds, diagnosis CT might be as good as barren enema. This is the most frequent cause, like we talked about before, of massive lower GI bleed diverticulosis. The most common cause of large bowel obstruction is diverticular disease. Again, let me say that again. Most common cause of large bowel obstruction, diverticular disease, more so than carcinoma. Some other types of bowel important items that might be on the exams. The difference between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. They do like to ask this. There's almost one question per exam. So remember Crohn's, all layers of the bowel wall, it does spare the rectum, they will talk about skip lesions and the patient may have fistulas and abscesses. Assertive colitis, mucosal layer only. So not all layers of the bowel wall. Ulcerative colitis involves the rectum as opposed to Crohn's. And this should be continuous colon segments and ulcerative colitis. So one way to distinguish between the two entities clinically. All right, cecal versus sigmoid volvulus. Cecal volvulus, sudden pain. Sigmoid volvulus, gradual distension. Stecal volvulus, and the question stem will say this, a young athletic patient comes in with sudden abdominal pain, and then they're gonna show you a diagnostic. It'll look kind of strange, but you'll see that there's an obstruction. And so then you'll be like, okay, stecal volvulus. The patient may be elder with sigmoid, um, or will be elder with sigmoid, and will be somebody with constipation. And then the repair for stecal volvulus is surgical. Sigmoid, it may be even medical, could potentially do it with the sigmoid scope or colonoscopy. Okay, pyloric stenosis, the GI major entity in children. There'll be a separate section just for a couple kid items. Uh, two weeks to two months of age, non-bilious vomiting, plus or minus projectile. The child will be hungry because they want to eat, but they continue to throw up. The child will be dehydrated. They might talk about an olive, right upper quadrant mass. Um, and then they might even talk about left to right peristaltic waves, but think about pyloric stenosis. In kids, Meckel's diverticulum, painless, massive rectal bleeding. The most common location is 40 to 100 centimeters from the iliopelvic junction. Remember, this is that rule of twos, right? So they'll talk about like 
you know, uh, two years old. Um, and then they'll talk about ectopic gastric mucosa from ileal ulceration and bleeding. Hirschsprung disease. This is a neonate, a neonate without meconium, or it could be an older infant or child with constipation or constipation. Remember, this is caused by no ganglion cells in the colon. Bacterial gastroenteritis, salmonella, causing bloody diarrhea, fever, abdominal pain, white blood cells greater than 15. Um, if you see that, think about that. We also talked a little bit about salmonella with some turtles um, or iguanas or some pets there or a patient who has sickle cell. Um, for Shigella, think bloody diarrhea, fever, tenesmus, normal white blood cells with pandemia. And then if there was an, uh, a question of seizures plus this diarrhea, think about Shigella. Intussusception, they do really like intussusception as a case. Most common site is the iliocolic location. It'll be intermittent colicky pain. Remember that this current jelly stool that they talk about, this a late finding, often they'll talk about the patient being like post or having these episodes of altered mental status that are becoming in waves. And the diagnosis, you may be able to see that target in the uh, colon. So the diagnosis may be air versus barium contrast. All right. HSP, all right, think about abdominal. So this is arena. This is actually like a really good way in mnemonic to remember this. Abdominal plane, plus or minus bloody stools, a rash, which happens to be purpuric, edema, nephritis, arthralgias, and arthritis. So if you're seeing a constellation of symptoms in a child with a rash who looks sick and not totally well, think about HSP, abdominal pain, rash, edema, nephritis, arthralgia, all right. That's the abdominal section. We're gonna to pivot to the cardiovascular section. If you have questions like Mike mentioned, please just put them in the chat and hopefully Mike and Denise can, can help take care of them. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of these cardiovascular entities. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the most common symptom is exertional dyspnea. These patients can get syncope in about 20 to 30%. This is the harsh murmur at the left lower sternal border or apex of the heart. Now, interestingly, this murmur will increase with Valsalva and standing. And if they ask you for some of these isometric testing, the murmur will decrease with squat, hand grip, or Trendelenburg. I have seen them pivot away from some of these isometric testing, but if they do, these are some of the things to think about. But of course, you will know that the patient stem may be a young patient, family history, sudden collapse. You're worried about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you see, um, other EKG, you might see really, really huge LVH. And then if you do a bedside pocus, you may see the patient with a very, very thickened, thickened LV. Mitral stenosis, the most common symptoms for mitral stenosis, exertional dyspnea and hemoptysis. So this is interesting, right? You got hemoptysis as one of your cardiovascular um, choices. When I think about hemoptysis, right, for us, the number one thing we think about in emergency medicine, we think about PD and we certainly think about TB, but here's an example where hemoptysis might be part of the scenario. Most common cause for mitral stenosis, rheumatic heart disease. Most patients develop atrial fibrillation. And here they talk about a mid-diastolic rumble. So mitral stenosis, think about mid-diastolic rumble. So these are some of the buzzwords. Mitral regurge. Okay, so the mitral stenosis is a diastolic murmur, but the mitral regurge is going to be a systolic murmur, but we'll get to that. The presentation for this patient, tachycardia, dyspnea, and pulmonary edema. And that makes sense, right? Because you're having a lot of backflow coming from um, the mitral uh, location. So you're kind of actually ending up with a very, very large amount of, uh, of blood flow, uh, fluid there that's pulling back in. Now, acute mitral regurgitation can cause endocarditis or an acute MI and you can end up with papillary muscle rupture. If you have chronic, think about rheumatic heart disease. Your systolic murmur for MR is going to be at the apex that radiates to the axilla. And I've often seen this be the thing, the patient having you know, chest pain, tachycardia, dyspnea, and then in the clinical scenario, they'll tell you that the systolic murmur is located at the apex radiating to the axilla. This should clue you in that the patient may have mitral regurgitation, and then they might have some of these other findings as well. Mitral valve prolapse. This is the most common valve disease that we see in some of the industrialized countries. Uh, most patients are asymptomatic. You can have this mid systolic click. And so this mid systolic click should be your buzzword for mitral valve prolapse. 
There is an increased risk of TIAs under the age of 35, but otherwise it is generally not associated with severe illness. Other reported symptoms may include syncope or hemoptysis. Aortic stenosis, all right? So this is also gonna be an a, a systolic murmur, but this patient has dyspnea, chest pain, and syncope. I think we had a really great case that we did of aortic stenosis uh, in conference. The causes can be congenital, rheumatic, and again, I mentioned the systolic right upper sternal border crescendo, decrescendo murmur that's radiating to the carotids. You may see a narrow pulse pressure of the patient, may have an EKG that shows LVH, but again, I want you to think about if they tell you that this systolic murmur is basically starting up high in the chest and then going up to the carotids, think about aortic stenosis. Often the patient will have dyspnea, chest pain, syncope. Now, aortic regurgitation. So this is going to be a diastolic murmur. All right, presentation will be dyspnea, pulmonary edema, a high-pitched blowing diastolic murmur at the upper sternal border. If it's acute aortic regurgitation, think about endocarditis and please think about aortic dissection. Okay. If it's chronic, think about rheumatic heart disease. Now, this patient might have some of the following. This They might use some of these buzzwords, wide pulse pressure, water hammer pulse, or even the patient may have head bobbing. I want you to think about aortic regurgitation. These are difficult. These are worth going back over just to kind of go through in your mind, find out three items for all of them. Just make sure that you have them down. And, you know, and, and, and when, I, and through studying, it's actually helped me considerably through clinical practice as well with these. All right. Treating valvular disease for aortic and mitral regurgitation, right? Remember you're having a ton of backflow right? So there's a lot of afterload for these patients. So what do you want to do? You want to reduce afterload. So you might do so with nitroglycerin. Maybe you'll do so with nitroprusside. If the patient's hypotensive, you may need vasopressors. And if the patient's in atrial fibrillation, make sure you control their rate. Let's talk about infective endocarditis. The most common cause of left-sided endocarditis would be strep viridans, staphylococcus, enterococcus. If the patient has uh, uh, IV drug use disorder, then you might consider right-sided causes. And in that case, you're really going to see staph aureus. Left-sided endocarditis, think about sepsis plus or minus heart failure. The patient may have Roth spots, which are retinal hemorrhages with central clearing. So you'll see a cholesterol plaque with some bleeding around it. Other things you might see, Osler nodes, Janeway lesions, splinter hemorrhages, you know, the treatment here now, we're not really giving this as much as might be a touch outdated here, but remember, we'll be often giving Vanco plus or minus aminoglycoside here. Right-sided endocarditis, usually acute. It's going to be fever, cough, chest pain, dyspnea, hemoptysis. The murmur is much less common to hear. The diagnosis really is going to be from an echo. Maybe you'll see it if you can find it, a, le a, a lesion. Sometimes I've had one of our residents actually see the lesion on the one of the valves, which has been really incredible. Uh, often it'll also be blood cultures. And again, this is gonna be something that we're gonna treat with Vanco plus an amino glycoside. All right, for MI, myocardial infarction, we're talking about fibrinolysis. The patient should have symptoms of an acute coronary syndrome, and you should see one millimeter ST elevation and two contiguous leads without any contraindications. Um, PCI not available within 90, Minutes. Now, this is the key thing that I want you to take from this slide, that the door to needle time is 30 minutes. So we talk about door to balloon time for cath being 90 minutes, but here door to needle time within 30 minutes. And so for a lot of us in these major, major tertiary quaternary care centers, you know, we're, we're always having the patient go to cath and that's available to us within 90 minutes. I have seen them ask specifically if you're practicing in the community as a community emergency medicine doctor and you can't get the patient to definitive cath, you can do this. Now, remember too, also, even if you give them uh, thrombolytics, 30 minutes, we're looking at Ultiplace, that uh, you will still potentially send, you're still going to send them to a cardiology center and they can also do catheterization there. Um, there's a good chunk of them that, that may not completely resolve the situation. All right. If the patient has a right ventricular infarct, okay, one of the things that we uh, the kind of the key highlights to remember is this will be a patient who may be showing you elevations in 2-3-F, and particularly if you see that the lead 3 is taller than lead 2, 
then you might be worried about not just the inferior MI, but that the right ventricle is involved. So you can do right ventricular leads and V4R is your best lead to look for ST elevations. And if you see that, um, and remember, you know, it's just, you're flipping it in uh, basically like a mirror from V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, to flipping it to the other side. And then you look at V4R for that. Now, the patient would probably be a little shocky. So beware nitrates because you do not want to give that or beta blockers or morphine, right? And in this case, you need to make sure that you give lots of preload because if the right ventricular is being involved, then you need to give lots of preload so you can, can give function to the left side. Okay. All right. So what are you seeing here? This is one of those like darlings of the, of the in-training exam or the written boards. Global ST segment elevation. There's a little PR depression. This is pericarditis. They love, love, love pericarditis. In fact, if you have an EKG, <laughs> you should be asking yourself one of like, these questions might be like, is this pericarditis? Just right off right off the bat if you see an EKG, okay? They do love it. All right. Now maybe the patient may have a pericardial effusion. So here, take a look. Globally, one of the things you'll see is you're gonna see low amplitude, and maybe you'll see this phenomenon of electrical alternance here. Now, in this case, it's like beat to beat where you're seeing electrical alternance. And what that is, is the heart just kind of floating, going back and forth. And what you're worried about is a patient has pericardial tamponade. And if the patient does, then you may have to do and set up for emergency pericardiocentesis. Okay, with some of our blocks, this is our second degree AV block type one. Right. In this case, the PR interval will get longer, 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 and then will drop. And so in that, this case tends to be in the AV node itself. This is not something that is a clinical emergency. There's probably very few scenarios where it could be an emergency, maybe in commotio cordis where you have a cardiac contusion. Uh, maybe if it's something where you're worried about um, a Lyme carditis. Uh, but otherwise, just this second degree type 1 by itself is not of concern. I'm trying to think about some other thing. Maybe in a massive MI um, and you're starting to see some conduction block, like especially the inferior because the RCA is supplied um, in the inferior. So that might be a condition. But otherwise, for the most part, this is not a serious condition. Secondary type 2 is a serious condition. Now, this is not going to be in the AV node. This block is going to be lower in the his segment and so one of the problems here you're going to see a you're going to see that the pr so remember our, our, our p waves are best seen in v2 and v1 and so in this case the p um r intervals they stay the same okay there's not this increasing like in type one they stay the same but what you do have is you just have a blocked beat a beat that just not does not go and that's concerning okay and then third degree is just complete dissociation right so the p waves if you kind of march them out they're doing their own thing here a p wave is located within the repolarization phase of the T wave, that's just not, that's not possible. Uh, like if we take a look at the rhythm strip, you know, P wave, P wave, um, you know, P wave. It, so it just, it, 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 these are not making sense. And then the QRSs are kind of doing their own thing too. So remember the second degree type two or third degree blocks are gonna be ones in which are gonna need to get pacing. Multifocal atrial tachycardia. So this is one of those that you're gonna see three or more P waves, and this is over a hundred rates. So this is gonna be fast, narrow, and irregular. And it's irregularly irregular, okay? And so it's important to be able to distinguish this from atrial fibrillation. Here in this case, you'll see P waves of different morphologies, like I said, three or more. Remember, if it happens to be slower than a hundred, it's called wandering atrial pacemaker, but faster than a hundred, it's multiple multifocal atrial tachycardia, and it's just different P waves saying they want to be in charge, and the patient's rate's going fast. How do you treat this? Well, often the patient will have some sort of underlying condition like COPD or some sort of bad respiratory condition. If you treat that, this will also resolve. WPW, Parkinson White. In this case, you're going to have that short PR interval, right? And you're going to have that delta wave. So here's a perfect example here. See the nice short PR interval and then that delta wave. And what this is, is this is an accessory pathway. This, um, and this, uh, you can either have signals that go directly down this accessory pathway, or you can have signals that kind of go down the, um, go down the track and then back up this accessory pathway or the reverse. So they can talk about it as like prodromic or orthodromic. Um, the key for you to remember is if a patient is in this horrible cycle and they're really tachycardic and they're going fast, you know, 
300 plus, um, the choice of medicine that they want you to treat the patient with is procanamide as kind of the buzz treatment, buzzword treatment for Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. All right, classic triad, short PR, wide QRS, delta wave. They can be predisposed to SVT, AFib, and atrial flutter. And then here's some examples of this really bad AFib with WPW. You may see that. Um, these are super, super fast. Patient will be generally very unstable and unwell. Irregularly irregular, wide complex tachycardia here if you have AFib with WPW. And the QRS morphology is going to vary with width. The rates are going to be really, really fast. And then, like I said, procan, or you may cardiovert the patient. Torsade de point. This is something that you can give magnesium to temporize the situation. Now, remember, this is a two gram magnesium, but you may have to give multiple. The way you will treat this patient is with overdrive pacing. And what do I mean by overdrive pacing as an answer? The overdrive pacing means that you're setting at a rate of like 120 because if you set at a fast rate, you're shortening the patient's overall conduction cycle so that QT shortens. If uh, you want to give a medication, that medication would be isoproteranol, but you might have to give electricity. In fact, you might have to end up cardioverting or defibrillating if this becomes completely unstable and the patient ends up coding. Okay, why complex tachycardias? Remember, no AV nodal blockers. And if you see a Y complex regular rhythm that's tachycardic, you really should be thinking about VT first. And on the boards, it's usually VT. They're usually not going to give you a patient with bundle branch block who's tachycardic. They're usually not going to give you an SVT patient, um, you know, with varying uh, blocks. That's that's just tachycardic. They're not giving you that. They're trying to get you to manage VT. And so you have to remember: is it stable, unstable, or pulseless? All right, in your algorithm. So causes of wide complex tachycardia. <laughs> so just remember that I want you to think about VT, 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 okay? As what's gonna be on the test. You know, this like sinus tachycardia with aberrant conduction, maybe, but on the boards, never soon SD, SVT with a bundle branch block. It is going to be VT for your boards, all right? Now, if you have hypertension and hypertensive encephalopathy, your treatment may be labetalol esmol or nitroprusside. Hypertension and stroke, you may consider something like um, just to stack some labetalol. Hypertension and pulmonary edema, think about nitroglycerin, ACE inhibitors, plus or minus a loop diuretic. Hypertension and MI, they want you to kind of treat with nitroglycerin. Hypertension and a th thoracic aortic dissection. Think about beta blocker like esmolol would be great. And that's kind of gone more in favor as opposed to something like nitroprosteroid. Hypertension and intracranial hemorrhage. Think about something like nicardipine with one of our calcium channel blockers here who has a really great anti-vasospastic property. Hypertension and pheochromocytoma. Think about giving phentolamine. And hypertension and eclampsia. Think about hydralazine or labetalol. All right, let's talk a little bit about aortic, abdominal aortic aneurysm. You know, if the patient is elder, hematuria, bad back pain, radiating um, to a side. It is not a kidney stone. It's going to be an aortic aneurysm, okay? That's going to be rupturing. So here's your classic triad for um, the aneurysm going to rupture, right? Pain, hypotension, pulsatile mass. 75% of the ruptures are going to be retroperitoneal. The patient, you may hear on them a brewery, unequal femoral pulses might be one of your clues, okay? Here you can see an aortic dissection. There's actually multiple chest x-ray findings. We often just think about the wide mediastinum, but you know you can also see blunting here. Um, a really great sign is the calcium sign. You might also end up seeing something um, uh, like if you put in a, if the patient has an NG tube, that that's deviated to the right. But this wide mediastinum is something that you're really worried about. The clinical scenario will be greater than 50 years, hypertension. If it happens to be a younger patient with aortic dissection, think about connective tissue disease or pregnancy. Approximately 90% have abrupt onset pain. You know, we know in real clinical practice, they don't use the word tearing, but if they use the word tearing on our exam, then for sure be thinking about aortic dissection. Presentations might be an MI, so don't get confused with the MI patient that, uh, that actually has a dissection. Um, remember, we talked about chest pain plus neurologic findings. So like they might look like a stroke, but think about aortic dissections. Um, and then they might have, like I said, spinal cord symptoms. So any chest pain with neurologic symptoms 
above and below the diaphragm, think about aortic dissection. Treatment might be your esmolol and then plus or minus beta uh, nitroprusside. And remember, that's for your type Bs. Uh, if it's a type A, then you really got to get the patient to the operating room. Okay. Okay. So that's what I just mentioned here. Ascending, right? Get surgical, descending, medical. All right. Thromboembolism. Think about arterial embolism, 85% from the heart. Multiple ways that this could happen. Mitral stenosis, AFib, some sort of cardiomyopathy. These are the acu acute occlusions, your six keys, pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresis slash paralysis, paresthesias, and then like polar or cold. Um, some of these will be like late, late, late findings. So just be mindful that if they're giving you some of these Ps, really do think about an extreme uh, extremity thromboembolism. Okay, some congenital heart disease. This is worth looking at a couple times. All right, if we're talking about blue babies, now we're talking about kids, think about right to left shunting. These are your terrible Ts, like your tetralogy of Fallot, your transposition of great arteries, your tricuspid atresia, your truncus arteriosus, your total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Think about these entities. It's worth looking into these entities in a few different types of scenarios, but these will give you blue babies. All right. If they happen to be, let's do let's do pink baby first. Okay, pink baby, CHF now with left to right shunting. So this might be a patient with a VSD or a patent ductus arteriosus or an endocardial cushion defect. Okay, and you are going to manage these patients um, for their heart failure. If they're modeled or gray, think about a systemic outflow tract obstruction. And what I really want you to think about here is aortic problems like coarctation of the aorta or aortic stenosis. Okay, so think about blue, gray, and pink babies. What are the patients with congenital heart disease? How might they present? They might present with poor feeding. Remember, poor feeding is their exertional activity. So poor feeding might be what's, what's uh, occurring. Sweating with feeds, sudden pallor or cyanosis. The treatment, right? So we talk about not giving PEEP because you don't want to decrease pulmonary blood flow. And in select patients, but one of the options that'll be there. So take a look at the indications for prostaglandin in specific congenital heart disease patients. All right. Why don't we take a break? I know one of our uh, one of our great APDs is going to take over the baton for me. But wishing you a fantastic, fantastic ITE, and if you're doing future boards, and I will see you next week. Uh, we'll be in person, and it'll be it'll be great. Show our love and support there. All right. Thanks, everyone. Mike. Uh, lesions. Did we start re-recording, Denise? Okay, cool. All right, so a few things to know, and one of your big differentiators for the exam as far as uh, cutaneous lesions go is Nikolsky sign. So just to remind everyone what Nikolsky sign is, it's when a minor rubbing causes desquamation of the underlying skin, including pigment. You'll see this in toxic epidermal necrolysis, pemphigus vulgaris, um, and staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, although our primary texts do differ on whether or not that's present in there, but for testing purposes, it is. Um, so it's just an example image of Nikolsky sign. As you can see, the skin is sloughing off over here. For pemphigus vulgaris, um, you're probably going to be able to narrow things down to two choices, and I always like to teach in the following way. So especially with pemphigus vulgaris, you're always going to bring up bolus pemphigoid. So both pemphigus vulgaris and bolus pemphigoid are autoimmune diseases characterized by blisters. Both can involve mucous membranes, um, but it's significantly less likely with bolus pemphigoid. Both are treated with systemic corticosteroids and the way to differentiate is whether or not uh, Nicolsi sign is present. Uh, the way I like to remember it is pemphigus vulgaris is more vulgar, therefore it's more serious of a disease, involves more systems, AKA your mucous membranes, and it has a Nicolsi sign that's positive. Um, this is staphylococcal scalded syn skin syndrome. It's usually seen at age uh, three to seven days, although it can be seen um, in older children as well. It's caused by staph aureus exfoliative toxins. Um, the typical presentation you're going to see on the ITE is a febrile infant with diffuse blanching erythema, often begins around the mouth. Um, skin findings will include fragile tense bullae that rupture on their own. So this is Nikolsky sign positive. The big thing about staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome is there's no mucous membrane involvement. Uh, the treatment for this is IV penicillinase resistant penicillin, so naps napsilin or oxacillin, and then just IV fluid replacement. Other thing you're going to see sometimes is uh, this sort of rash. So IT, especially with dermal, just show you pictures of rash. Um, so I know this is an older woman that's pictured here, but a typical uh, thing for this sort of pathology, which I'll explain in a second, is child sees his pediatrician, is diagnosed with pharyngitis, started on amoxicillin, 
and after completing a seven-day course presents with a rash. Um, this could be amoxicillin rash, uh, which can present upwards after the first dose or even like a few weeks after receiving amoxicillin. Not a true reaction, but does sort of cause a rash that starts on the trunk and spreads. Um, however, what we're more concerned about is erythema multiforme. <clears throat> so how do you differentiate this between that and drug rash? Um, so erythema multiform uh, starts out as these target lesions, which become confluent. Um, it's very typical to follow after an HSV infection. There's nothing to do for this other than supportive treatment. The second most common cause secondary to HSV is penicillin treatment. Um, and then, <clears throat> sorry, go to the next one here. So next one is Stephen Johnson slash TEN. So think of this as a spectrum of disease. So SJS being the less severe form, but still highly lethal. Um, in one sentence, just a way to think about this is just diffuse epidermal necrosis and detachment. Um, these are most often drug-induced, and the most commonly implicated drugs are allopurinol, sulfas, penicillins, and phenytoin. A uh, classic presentation you're going to see on the ITE is an AIDS patient who's taking sulfa prophylaxis, so Bactrim. Um, early symptoms will include fever, flu-like symptoms, followed by formation of these blisters. Mucous membranes are involved. So SJS is when skin sloughing is involved in less than 10% of the body surface area, TEN is when sloughing is greater than 30% BSA. Treatment for these is removal of the offending agent and then admission to a burn unit. So next up is always going to be, again, these usually get narrowed down to two choices on the IT, especially for derm, is cellulitis versus erysepelis. So cellulitis, pretty much we all know, is poorly demarcated borders. Erysepelis is pictured here, typically located on the face and has a well-demarcated border. Things to know for the exam, um, it's most commonly caused by group A strep and can be treated with uh, dicloxacillin or erythromycin. And again, for cellulitis, just a point on cellulitis, uh, on the test, most folks are going to know that the initial treatment for cellulitis is Keflex and or Bactrim. So you're usually going to have a patient with a cellulitic rash and an allergy to Keflex or Bactrim, and it's going to ask you the next most appropriate antibiotic. You can use either clindamycin or doxycycline. For necrotizing infections, so necrotizing fasciitis is rare, but a rapidly progressive fatal bacterial infection. Patients often present with soft tissue swelling and pain near the site of previous trauma. Pain generally is out of proportion to exam, except generally in patients who have some sort of neuropathy. So like diabetic patients may not have any pain at all. You'll see fever, systemic signs of illness. As far as the uh, skin findings are concerned, the sort of or concern is brawny edema, induration, and then palpable crepitus with overlaying bullae. Um, X-rays can show subcutaneous emphysema. Um, most sensitive or most specific thing you can do to diagnose is just a surgical cut down. There are three different types of necrotizing infection to be aware of, uh, which are polymicrobial infections, uh, type two, which is strep pyogenes, and then type three, which is your clostridial, uh, which causes gas gangrene. And for that, you want to add on your clindamycin. So uh, herpes simplex uh, presents with these sorts of lesions. So this is HSV-1 or these oral lesions, uh, corneal ulcers, stomatitis, and fever. HSV-2 is your vesicles on the genitalia and anus. Um, <clears throat> these are just the typical appearance of them. There are certain pictures I would say you just have to memorize both for clinical practice and for ITE, and this is one of them. We'll go into this in a little bit more in detail in a little bit. Um, big thing to know for HSV, though, and for any sort of herpetic lesions is distinguishing herpetic lesion from disseminated zoster. So zoster is a varicella zoster virus reactivation, causes painful uh, vesicles. Um, disseminated zoster technically is when there's three or more dermatomes. Again, three or more dermatomes is considered disseminated zoster. Um, I added one picture in here, this one on the lower part, just to uh, show what ocular involvement is. Sometimes the question on the exam, again, is going to be differentiating between herpes simplex keratitis and herpes zoster ophthalmicus. How do you differentiate the two? Keratitis involves solely just the cornea. You're going to see a dendritic pattern, but nothing on the skin itself. Herpes zo uh, zoster ophthalmicus will include the surrounding skin. Sometimes you may get the Hutchinson sign, which will be on the nose, which is not pictured here. This is just V1 distribution uh, zoster. Herpes zoster ophthalmicus and the Hutchinson sign will be on the very tip of the nose. There'll be more slides later on that as well. So uh, next thing is HSP or henoch shanlin purpura. Um, this is typically seen by abdominal pain, GI bleeding, hematuria, palpable purpura, arthritis. It's an immune-mediated vasculitis, has these pathognomonic skin lesions. Uh, for anyone that's done PEDS, you will see these clinically in practice. Um, they're actually uh, gravity-dependent areas, so you're going to see them more in the legs and distal extremities. 
On the exam, you're going to have a kid come in with this sort of colicky abdominal pain. Um, a thing to know for the exam, too, is that it can present with ilio, ilio, uh, intussusception, bloody diarrhea, and this po uh, migratory polyarthritis. Um, Long-term prognosis is determined by the degree of renal involvement. Again, for the exam, long-term prognosis is determined by the degree of renal involvement. Your treatment for this is going to be mostly supportive, including NSAIDs, steroids in extreme cases, um, and present. Uh, this usually generally requires admission. The mnemonic to remember is arena, abdominal pain, rash, the palpable purpura. Platelet counts are typically normal, just as a reminder, because you can see some purpura in uh, thrombocytopenia, edema, nephritis, and again, just to hammer home, the uh, prognosis long-term is determined by degree of renal involvement and then arthralgias. Okay, so that's everything pretty much for your high yield cutaneous disorders. Next up, we're gonna do endocrine and metabolic. Just a quick overview of acid-based stuff, which is never exciting. Respiratory alkalosis is typically caused by hyperventilation. Respiratory acidosis is typically caused by hypoventilation. Your metabolic alkalosis is typically caused by volume and potassium de depletion. Uh, respiratory compensation is generally immediate while metabolic lags behind by about 24 hours. Um, to calculate your anion gap in metabolic acidosis, it's your sodium minus your chloride plus your bicarb. The way I do it, I just carry this over. So it's sodium minus chloride minus bicarb gives you your anion gap. Uh, again, we're a little spoiled at work. Our anion gap on our machines is a little higher than what is tested, which is generally 12. Um, to see if there is a compensated uh, uh, metabolic acidosis, you can use Winter's formula for the PCO2, uh, which is shown here. If the PCO2 is not in this range that you calculate, you have a superimposed primary respiratory uh, process in addition to your metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis can be caused by a lot of different things, but primarily increased acid production. Um, can also be caused by decreased acid exc excretion in renal diseases, as well as loss of uh, alkali. Common mixed disturbances include a primary metabolic acidosis and primary respiratory alkalosis. That in particular is highly specific for salicylate toxicity or sepsis. Again, on the exam to help differentiate if you have a patient with a primary metabolic uh, acidosis and a primary respiratory alkalosis, if they're young and if there's any sort of psychiatric history mentioned, you wanna think salicylate toxicity. If they're older and you have this combination, you wanna think occult sepsis. Things to think about for your anion gap acidoses is the cat mud vials. So carbon monoxide exposure and cyanide exposure. For these two to differentiate, cyanide exposure can give you a metabolic acidosis, but would also give you a significantly high lactic acidemia as opposed to carbon monoxide, which should not. Your alcoholic ketoacidosis can cause you to have a high anion gap metabolic acidosis with a normal BHB and normal bicarb. Um, so just something to be aware of. Toluene exposure uh, can also give you a high anion gap metabolic acidosis and then our typical mud piles. Methanol intoxication, uremia, DKA. Uh, uh, gosh, I can't pronounce these this morning, so you're just going to have to read them. Sorry about that. Isoniazid and iron intoxication, lactic acidosis, ethylene glycol, and salicylate intoxication. For your non-anion gap uh, metabolic acidosis, this implies a loss of bicarb. We generally see these in folks who have high volume diarrhea or a lot of vomiting. Um, enterostomy uh, is also another common thing. Uh, renal loss of bicarb, think your RTAs or folks who are on acetylazolamide and then hyperalimentation. All right, hypernatremia. Um, anything sodium is typically everybody's favorite thing. So hypernatremia is typically due to unreplaced water that's lost from the GI tract or skin. Uh, excessive water loss rarely itself leads to hypernatremia. However, it's the result of increased plasma osmolality that stimulates thirst. And when you drink more fluid, that's when you start to get this true hypernatremia. Um, thus, in patients who have access to water, hypernatremia primarily occurs in those who are unable to sense thirst or respond to thirst normally. Um, this is most commonly seen in two groups, uh, infants and then adults who are altered, so you're elderly. Um, this, again, significantly more rarely caused by excess sodium gain. If that's the true case, it's either iatrogenic, hyperaldosteronism, or Cushing's disease. Um, again, for sodium that's too high in the acute setting, if they are clinically hypovolemic, it is okay to administer IV fluid. However, you just have to be cognizant that it can cause brain edema and seizures if you correct too rapidly. Think of the statement from high to low, your brain will blow. Uh, the maximum rate of correction is going to be 12 milliequivalents per day of sodium. So you aim for about 0 0.5 milliequivalents per hour. Uh, I'm going to send out a list to everybody shortly to the residents of a must know formulas. Don't worry about memorizing this now. This is stuff sort of to cram the night before. Um, as far as like calculating a free water deficit, you will have to do this on the exam sometimes. 
Um, clinically, what you should know is calculating the patient's free water deficit and anticipated rate of correction. This is something I always pull up at bedside when I'm doing, I don't like to just like do this off the cuff. For hyponatremia, so sodium too low, uh, symptoms depend on the level and the rate of decline. So a level below 120 is considered critical and generally folks who have a rapid decline, you can rapidly correct and folks who have a more uh, slow decline, you have to slowly correct. There's three different classifications of hyponatremia, hypovolemic hyponatremia. So your patients appear clinically dehydrated. These are the folks you can just treat with IV fluids. This is usually due to some renal losses or vomiting and usually do it in about 500 uh, milliliter aliquots at a time and recheck BMPs. For your euvolemic hyponatremia, um, this is treatment generally with fluid restriction. This is usually due to SIADH or psychogenic polydipsia. Um, hyperlipidemia and hyperglycemia can also cause pseudohyponatremia, just something to think about you'll see uh, as a euvolemic hyponatremia. Um, and then lastly, hypervolemic hyponatremia, uh, decreased free water excretion. This is usually due to retaining a lot of extra water. So heart failure, renal failure, treatment with this is IV fluid and loop diuretics. I included this little chart here if anybody wants to screenshot this. Again, major things you'll see on the exam here to think about in uh, hyponatremia and hypernatremia uh, utilizing serum sodium, serum osmolality, and urine osmolality. It's also a useful chart to have just clinically. All right, so hyperkalemia or when the potassium is too high. Uh, most common cause, uh, which again is sometimes a test question, is lab error, aka hemolysis. Everybody knows we work at hemolysis, hemolysis centers of excellence, so we're used to seeing hyperkalemia from hemolysis. Um, but other things to think about is renal failure, acute acidosis, tissue necrosis, so trauma patients, for example, who had a limb that was crushed, um, transfusion reactions, GI bleed, and certain medications such as your ACE inhibitors and ARBs can cause uh, uh, hyperkalemia. Um, things you'll see on EKG is peak T waves, a widened QRS, a prolonged PR, um, flattening and eventual loss of P waves. Um, this sort of progressive as hyperkalemia advances, uh, you know, the most dangerous thing you're gonna see is a sine wave, which literally looks like a mathematical sine wave, V-fib and asystole. Um, again, if you see an EKG like this, wide complex, peak T waves, think hyperkalemia. And another thing, anyone who knows my morning reports on hyperkalemia and ECGs, if you have wide complex and bradycardia, you always want to think hyper-K until proven otherwise. Now, uh, again, with potassium treatment modality that you want to do, you want to protect the heart. First thing you're going to do is give some calcium. Um, it shortens the QT interval. If you have a patient that has true wide complex, um, either bradycardia or wide complex from hyper-K, Stay at bedside, keep pushing calcium till the uh, QRS complex narrows. Um, you, to push potassium into cells, you're gonna be using albuterol, bicarb. I know it says if acidemic cure, majority of us use this clinically, also we'll just give uh, bicarb as well as insulin. Uh, you give uh, dextrose to prevent hypoglycemia. Generally, the threshold is if a blood sugar is 250 or above, you do not give D50 or dextrose. If it's 250, less than 250, you give dextrose in addition to insulin. The only thing that can actually excrete potassium to know about is lokelma and kaxalate. Again, just for uh, emphasis sake on the exam, the only thing that can actually directly bind and excrete potassium is lokelma and kaxalate. We also use furosemide, which can block reabsorption of potassium. Another thing to know about about kaxalate, not so much with lokelma, um, is that they're both exchange resins, but kaxalate significantly more so than lokelma can cause intestinal ischemia. Um, for hypokalemia, symptoms you're going to see for patients is muscle weakness, cramping, as well as respiratory muscle weakness. You may see U waves clinically on an ECG in patients that are hypokalemic, but they're not specific for hypokalemia. Um, treatment for this is replacing with either PO or IV potassium. Just to know if you're giving IV potassium, it can cause pain and localized phlebitis. It is not necessary to stop the infusion. You can just give a hot pack and continue with the infusion. Um, pH can increase by, or I'm sorry, potassium, blah. pH can increase by 0.10 as potassium decreases by 0.5, just a formula to know. This will be on that sheet I'm going to send out to everybody as well, so don't bother writing this down. If, I know it's a little fast here. Reasons people become hypokalemic is renal losses, diuretic, excess glucocorticoid, or GI, GI losses, vomiting, and diarrhea. If you have a patient with refractory hypokalemia, check a magnesium level that's particular in our uh, ethanol using patients. And then also just a, a disease syndrome to be aware of is hypokalemic periodic paralysis. It's an autosomal dominant disorder that typically begins in adolescence, leads to these periods of just complete body paralysis and weakness. 
that then resolve and you may find transient hypokalemia um, in those cases. So for hypercalcemia, now going to calcium, uh, the most common outpatient cause is going to be hyperparathyroidism. Most common inpatient cause is malignancy. Um, this is going to present your patients with stones, bones, groans, and psychiatric overtones. So kidney stones, bone pains, or occult fractures, abdominal pain and nausea, and altered mental status. Um, your ECG may show shortened QT interval. Um, the teaching point here and the thing to remember for the exam is the most common renal manifestation of hypercalcemia is polyuria, not stones, but polyuria due to a defect in concentrating ability. This can lead to dehydration, but you can see kidney stones. But again, the most common sign and symptom for the exam is polyuria. The treatment of hypercalcemia is going to be to restore intravascular volume. So you're going to give IV fluid and you're also going to give uh, to decrease calcium levels. You can also use loop diuretics. You can also use calcitonin to reduce osteoclastic activity. But your thing that you're primarily going to do is treat the primary disorder for folks who are really, really sick. So really severe hypercalcemia, meaning ECG changes that are not just short PR interval, but true dysrhythmias, you may want to consider dialysis. For hypocalcemia, so lots of different causes. Uh, you can have hypoparathyroidism from post-surgical removal of the thyroid gland or parathyroid gland. That's actually clinically one of the most common reasons we'll see. Renal failure, vitamin D deficiency, and then pancreatitis. Signs you may see on exam are tetany, which may be mild, so perioral numbness, paresthesias, or severe, where you get carpal pedal spasm, laryngospasm, seizures. This is also where you can get your uh, Trousseau, Trousseau sign and your Schwastek sign. Um, Things to know for the exam uh, as well, altered albumin states can alter your calcium level. I'll send out again, like I said, that list of uh, formulas to know for the exam, but just know if you have altered albumin states, so most commonly in patients with malignancy um, or folks who are deconditioned, you have to correct for the true calcium level. DKA, caused by a lack of insulin, no surprise. Um, things to know, half-life of IV regular insulin is less than 10 minutes. So for DKA, we use a continuous drip. Um, most important treatment to start, especially if you're suspecting DKA, is IV normal saline. Uh, most common cause in the United States is medication noncompliance, followed secondly by infection or MI. So very important in DKA patients to always get a 12-lead ECG. You're going to see this sometimes on the exam. They're going to present to you an ECG with a patient who has a STEMI, and will present this sort of uh, picture for you and ask you what the underlying etiology of a patient's DKA is. The answer is going to be STEMI. Thing you need to know for the exam, though, is treatment is fluid, fluid, fluid. Um, do not begin replacing or altering electrolytes. And what I mean by that is uh, either empirically giving potassium or giving insulin without knowing the potassium levels. Um, cardiac arrest in DKA is generally secondary to hypokalemia. So if you have a patient who is in uh, cardiac arrest and they give this DKA picture, empirically begin to give potassium. Um, you begin supplementing potassium. If it's uh, less than 3.3, um, you're going to be giving potassium with insulin. If it's greater than 5.5, you do not need to give potassium. And then things to know if the potassium is less than 3.3, give potassium first, then insulin. Um, HHNC or hyperosmolar, uh, non-ketotic, I don't know. I remember this as HHNK, but hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, non-ketotic coma. Infection is a very common etiology. Focal neuro findings are very common. Again, these are patients who may present with hyperglycemia and quote unquote may recrudesce, especially if they have a prior CVA. Majority have underlying renal or cardiac impairment. The big differentiating factor for this is it's more so a longer duration before presentation than DKA, more comorbid uh, conditions, and usually uh, more altered mental status than DKA. Hypoglycemia. Uh, symptoms generally begin to appear at 40 to 50 uh, milligrams per deciliter. One amp of D50 will raise your blood glucose by anywhere from 40 to 350 milligrams per deciliter. If patient does not have IV access, you can give glucagon one milligram intramuscularly. You may see your EMS folks do this, um, but just know it may be ineffective in folks who have alcohol use disorder because they run out of their glycogen stores. Um, <clears throat> Always consider hypoglycemia in an unresponsive patient. And for refractory hypoglycemia, consider cortisone, uh, AKA some like adrenocortical uh, insufficiency. Another pearl to remember is beta blocker can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia in folks who do take beta blockers. Alcoholic ketoacidosis. So an alcoholic patient presents with nausea, vomiting, epigastric pain. Labs show an, non, an anion gap metabolic acidosis, but the pH is normal. The serum ketones are negative. What does this patient have? Likely alcoholic ketoacidosis, and that's the common uh, exam uh, question you're going to see. The hallmark of AKA is an anion gap acidosis with a normal pH, a normal bicarb, and normal serum ketones. 
um, what you do for this and typically what's seen as binge drinking followed by poor PO intake, um, alcohol metabolism inhibits gluconeogenesis, symptoms, you can have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, dehydration, disorientation, typically associated with a very large anion gap. Clinically, I'm sure most folks are familiar with this. Your drinker who comes in, anion gap of like 24, 27, sometimes 30. Um, you always wanna make sure there's no co-ingestion with things like methanol or ethylene glycol. Treatment for these folks is uh, IV fluid resuscitation, thiamine, uh, dextrose, and electrolyte replacement as needed. Hyperthyroidism. Most common cause you're gonna see of thyroid storm is Graves' disease. Excuse me. You're also going to see anxiety, tremor, insomnia, sometimes heat intolerance. For folks who have uh, seen patients with true hyperthyroidism uh, in real life, they're very like jumping off the bed, uh, talking a mile a minute, almost appear manic, um, but do have this sort of insidious history of anxiety, not being able to sleep, weight loss, sweating, tachycardia. Um, lab work, you may see hyperglycemia, hypercalcemia, elevated LFTs. Um, Amiodarone, just also to know, can cause acute thyrotoxicosis and up to a quarter of patients taking it. Treatment for this, in order, it's important to memorize this order. First, what you're going to do is get block peripheral effects of uh, hyperthyroidism. So you're going to give a beta blocker, generally propanolol, as it also has some thyroid blocking uh, abilities. Then you're going to give PTU or methimazole. Remember, PTU is safe in pregnancy. Generally, first trimester pregnancy, you're going to reach for PTU. Second trimester and afterwards, you can give methimazole. Then you're going to block hormone release by giving iodine or lithium. And then lastly, you can give uh, Decadron to prevent peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. Hypothyroidism. Causes include overtreatment of grave disease, dietary iodine deficiency, autoimmune destruction of the thyroid, so Hashimoto's, and a side effect of certain medications, again, amiodarone and lithium. Um, signs and symptoms you're going to see is altered sensorium, may present similar to CO2 narcosis, psychosis, CHF, bradycardia, hypotension, pericardial effusion. Um, again, this note about uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and hypothyroidism, sure, it's a good pearl to know for the exam. Clinically, I don't know how impressive that is. The most sensitive test for this to know for the exam, again, the most sensitive test is going to be thyroid stimulating hormone. Chest x-ray, you may see pleural effusion, pericardial effusion. Um, again, Quick uh, comment here about myxedema coma for your patients that present hypo hypotensive, cold, uh, with edema, things you wanna think about, cardiogenic shock plus myxedema coma. So those are always two things you wanna have on your, your differential clinically for a patient who's cold, edematous, hypotensive, and maybe bradycardic. Um, it is a medical emergency, uh, more commonly seen in women in winter months. If they're cold and confused uh, for the exam, think myxedema coma. So what are you gonna do for patients who are in myxedema coma? You're gonna replace thyroid immediately with T4. Can you use T3? Yes, you can use T3. However, T3 uh, can cause a little bit more uh, clinical side effects such as dysrhythmia, which is why we uh, reach for thyroxine T4 first. Um, you always wanna see what precipitating factors folks have to throw them into acute hypothyroid or myxedema coma. Things you'll see is CHF and pneumonia. Um, and then you want to reverse uh, metabolic abnormalities as you can. So you see uh, elevated CO2 levels, usually from verdipnea and decreased glucose level as a direct result of hypothyroidism. So you're going to want to correct, correct those clinically with either supplemental oxygen, positive pressure ventilation, and administration of uh, peripheral glucose. Adrenal insufficiency. So most common cause is withdrawal from exogenous steroid therapy. Um, hypotension clinically will typically fail to respond to typical resuscitative measures. So you usually have to give some sort of uh, steroid IV. The number one cause um, outside of uh, um, uh, steroid withdrawal is gonna be autoimmune disease. And then if you have a traveler, you also wanna think tuberculosis. The exam loves throwing TB out there because again, in the US, Outside of New York City, believe it or not, we don't really see it that often. So you wanna think TB also as a cause sometimes of adrenal insufficiency. Um, what do you do for these patients? Again, this is not necessarily emergency medicine wheelhouse, but they like to test this on the ITE. Um, if the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency is not concern, uh, confirmed, you can use uh, dexamethasone phosphate. If you have known adrenal insufficiency, you can use hydrocortisone. If you have no IV access, you have a patient who's hypotensive and you suspect it's from acute adrenal insufficiency, you can give cortisone acetate IM. I've never seen that clinically. Um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, just things to know for the exam. Increased ACTH causes excess androgens and ambiguous genitalia. 
Um, these are hopefully well diagnosed before they make their way over to an ER doctor, but just things to know. Um, vomiting can lead to dehydration and circulatory collapse of the neonate. You'll have dysrhythmias generally from hyperkalemia and concomitant acidosis. Hypoglycemia can cause refractory seizures. So treatments essentially as you find it, IV fluids, correct glucose and potassium and give hydrocort. For hypoglycemia, um, for infants you're gonna and, and younger children, you're gonna correct with different measures. So we're very used to giving D50 in the adult world. I like to remember this by everything equals 50 for treatment. So if they're infants, you're gonna be giving five milliliters per kilogram of 10 10% dextrose. So five times 10 is 50. So again, for infants, five cc's per kg of 10% dextrose. And again, the hypoglycemia cutoff is different for infants, it's 30. For older children, you're gonna give two cc's per kg of 25% dextrose, so two times 25 is 50. And again, the hypoglycemia cutoff for them is 40 milligrams per deciliter. And then for an adult, you're just gonna give D50 at one ml per kg, not really, um, but that's just the way the, the mental scheme to remember it is everything should be equaling up to 50. So again, an infant, 10% dextrose at five mLs per kg, an older child, 25% dextrose at two mLs per kg, and then adults get D50. All right, so moving along to environmental, just gonna take a quick water break. Brown recluse spider. Okay, the bite causes a very mild erythematous lesion. Uh, in most cases, it causes a severe localized reaction, immediate pain, blister, discoloration. The necrosis and central eschar can form over three to four days. So what is loxellicism refers to the systemic reaction that can happen one to two days after the bite, fever, chills, vomiting, myalgias, and then hemolysis. The thing to know about, about brown recluse is it can cause renal failure and DIC. The bite is never witnessed. No one comes into the emergency department saying they got a spider bite and actually saw a spider bite. It's never a spider bite until it actually is. Um, there is no true treatment. It's supportive care, but you can consider Dapsone, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and steroids. Um, black widow spider bite. Um, immediate pinprick sensation, so the bite is often witnessed. They may sometimes see a spider, um, but again, clinically, no one ever actually sees the spider. Symptom onset is very fast. So usually within an hour, they have an erythematous target-shaped lesion. They're experiencing painful myalgias. Um, things to know about the black widow spider for the exam and clinically it can mimic an acute abdomen. They'll be peritonitic. They're not going to be wanting you to touch the abdomen. Um, analgesia may not even be sufficient. So actually recommendation sometimes is for benzodiazepines for muscle cramping. And again, your treatment is supportive care for severe envenomation and what's considered severe envenomation, the old, the young, and the pregnant, you're going to want to hospitalize and give antivenin. Common things to know for marine envenomations. Again, this is stuff just to memorize and just to list off in bullet point. Most common marine envenomation you're going to experience in the United States is going to be the stingray. For jellyfish and man of war, you're going to want to give vinegar. You're never urinating on anything. I'm going to repeat that for everybody. You're never urinating on anything at all. You hear that, Matt Filani. So for jellyfish and man of war, you're going to give vinegar. For spine envenomations, you're going to want to remove the spine and cover with hot water, typically pretty hot, 45 degrees Celsius. So like think hot tub level hot. For ocean infections caused by Vibrio species, you're gonna to wanna to give Bactrim, doxycycline, fluoroquinolone. They're usually gonna give you something like the patient was shucking oysters or something along those lines, and they'll come in with a little cellulitis. You're gonna to wanna to think Vibrio and give Bactrim, doxy, or fluoroquinolone. For pit vipers or your crotalids, um, you're, these are the most common venomous snakes, rattlesnakes, moccasins, and copperheads. Um, all cases are potentially venomous and should be discussed with poison control. Things to know, you never put a tourniquet on these. Never, ever, ever tourniquet these. It's an old school thing. Do not tourniquet them at all. Movement does cause muscle contraction and increase absorption of venom. So instead of tourniqueting, what you're going to want to do is immobilize all these extremities, similar to how you would for a suspected fracture. What you really need to know for the exam, despite being able to differentiate a crotalid from a, a lapid, which we'll get to in a second, for crotalids, you're going to want to give antivenom. The indications for antivenom are progression of local injury, so worsening pain and swelling, any clinical evidence of coagulopathy, hypotension, confusion. So you're going to want to give four to six vials of antivenom at a time. You observe for at least an hour. If there is no symptom control or poor symptom control, you give an additional four to six vials. If there's adequate response to symptom control, you give another four vials every six hours for up to three doses, and there are no absolute contraindications for antivenom. So again, just want to emphasize for the exam, do not tourniquet. 
And then if you have refractory symptoms or really high acuity symptoms, coagulopathy, renal failure, all those sort of things, you're going to want to give antivenin, which is crofab. And the number to remember is four to six vials of antivenin. Now for your elapids, so a thing to remember is red on yellow is going to kill a fellow. These can have progressively worsening neurotoxicity, and these you generally admit for 24 to 48 hours. You can give early antivenom before symptoms start, um, but generally the rule of thumb is to wait for respiratory symptoms before administering antivenom. But again, these can cause numbness, palsies, and paralysis, so you admit for observation. All right, diving-related injuries. Uh, ITE loves to ask these questions. Uh, I sent everybody a document too that has a really nice chart I made to go over these. Uh, so for baritis externa or external ear squeeze, this is when the external auditory canal becomes blocked either by a uh, pre-existing ceremon or folks will dive with earplugs or certain diving hoods like collapse around the ears. Um, the issue becomes it cannot equalize pressures just due to how tight the blockage is. So you have increased uh, ex external auditory canal, auditory canal pressure with increased depth that leads to edema and sometimes hemorrhage. You'll see acute ear pain, um, an endemous outer ear. The treatment for this is just antibiotic eardrops and dry ear precautions. Um, for middle ear or baritis media, this is the most common diving related ear injury. Increased death leads to increased pressure on the TM. Patients may have ear pain, some vertigo. They may have a ruptured TM. You give antibiotic uh, drops of floxacin if they have a ruptured TM. If not, you just give them dry ear precautions. And for inner ear or baritis interna, um, the uh, external auditory canal equalizes too much. Um, causes over distension of the internal ear and leads to rupture and bleeding. Um, this can cause decreased hearing vertigo. And then you're going to have clinical signs uh, as well, things like nystagmus. Patients who you suspect baritis interna or inner ear um, diving related injury, they should be referred to an ENT. They don't need to be emergently seen by an ENT, but should be referred to an ENT. That's the test answer. You're going to see, again, if they have tinnitus, deafness and vertigo, AKA clinical overt signs of any issue um, with a ruptured uh, TM, you're gonna wanna refer to ENT. Decompression sickness. Um, so things to know about decompression sickness, this is related to nitrogen. So nitrogen is forced into tissue at high pressures. On rapid ascent, nitrogen pops out of the tissue before it's be able to be reabsorbed. So you get two types. So there's type one uh, decompression sickness, which is mostly musculoskeletal injury injuries, AKA called the bends. Um, you may sometimes also get a rash with the bends, which is called cutis marmorata. Um, it's just this erythematous rash, nothing really to do for it. And again, really nothing to do for the bends other than symptomatic management. The more concerning one is what's called the staggers, um, which is a constellation of symptoms that is type two um, decompression sickness. And this is when you have um, neuro and palm symptoms. So it's a uh, the staggers in particular is a combination of inner ear disorder, plus all the other things, uh, bladder dysfunction, uh, shortness of breath, pulmonary dysfunction. They all have these fun names like the chokes and all this other sort of stuff. What you need to know is if you're suspecting type two decompression sickness. So again, just to emphasize, if they have pulmonary findings, neuro findings, or inner ear findings, and they are ascending, um, you want to um, give IV fluids, supplemental oxygen, severe cases, think of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. When are you going to do hyperbaric oxygen therapy if they're having significant findings, such as uh, persistent tachycardia and hypoxia, uh, like concerning for PE, paresthesias, and true clinical weakness? Those will be the folks who will be directed towards hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, just something to know for the exam. So again, severe symptoms. And again, we're all, you know, pretty knowledgeable people. If you're reading the exam question, they're ascending and they have legit neuro findings or legit palm findings. The answer is going to be hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Otherwise it's going to be supportive measures. Um, pops. So pulmonary overpressurization syndrome. So when the diver ascends without exhaling, alveoli can rupture. Symptoms may be delayed up to a day, but things you're going to see clinically on exam is a full neck. You're going to have palpable crepitus at times. They may present with pneumomediastinum, which is more common than everything else you're seeing listed here. The rare things to get concerned about is pneumothorax and arterial gas embolism. Um, for pneumomediastinum, it's conservative management. It self-resorbs within one to two weeks. 
For pneumothorax, it's chest tube as needed. Again, if it's greater than 10% of the lung window. And then for arterial gas embolism, it's gonna be hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Again, same thing to know here. Hyperbarics is indicated if they have severe findings. Again, I wanna emphasize pneumomediastinum is, is very benign in this condition and it's conservative management. Pneumomediastinum does not go to hyperbaric therapy. Everything else goes to hyperbaric therapy, excluding also very small pneumothoraces. Electrical injuries. Um, so things to know about electrical injuries, tissue resistance um, goes in the following order, bone, then fat, then tendon, then skin, then muscle, then blood, then nerve. Um, just overall things, just I'll read the things on the slide here first. So low voltage AC in the household can commonly cause V-fib. High voltage or direct current can cause asystole. Internal injury is very common. You'll see rhabdo. You'll also see posterior shoulder dislocation. Um, fetal mortality is very high, even with low current injuries due to low resistance of amniotic fluid. So folks who are pregnant and get electrocuted always need a formal OB exam because the amniotic fluid has very low resistance and cause fetal death. Um, for AC or alternating current, alternating current produces more severe injury than direct current. Again, alternating current or AC produces more severe injuries than direct current. Alternating current, look for an exit injury. You'll have an entrance wound. People who have alternating current will be stuck and will be repetitively stimulated and contracted and then will eventually like blow off. Um, so they'll have typically an entrance wound and an exit wound. A direct current will have a much larger exit wound than entrance wound. These tend to cause huge explosions. So I'm sure we've probably all seen on TV or on you know those weird websites where you touch a high like uh, a high current thing and the guy gets blown away. That's a direct current, um, but again, not as deadly as alternating current. And then for infants, I know Manish touched on this in the first uh, lecture, but delayed labial artery bleeding for kids who bite a cord typically occurs on day five after the scab falls off. So if you see a kid in the emergency department who bit an electric wire, whose name was Matt Villani, you want to refer them back to the ED at day five, or at least just make them know at day five, they may have severe bleeding if the scab falls off and make sure they're not picking the scab. All right, altitude illness. We're almost there, folks. High altitude illness. So you always want to think of this on a spectrum of disease with pathophysiology, acute mountain sickness being the most mild, and then high altitude cerebral edema and high altitude pulmonary edema being the most severe. So for acute mountain sickness typically occurs above 8,000 feet. Symptoms are similar to a hangover. Uh, the treatment for that is acetazolamide and descent. For all of these, just a quick, quick um, aside, the best treatment you're always going to get is descent. If descent is an option, choose descent. Um, pulmonary edema. So uh, high altitude associated pulmonary edema, typically seen above 10,000 feet. It's a precursor to high altitude cerebral edema. Again, these are all sort of on a spectrum. It'll be symptoms similar to CHF, acute onset uh, dyspnea, rails bilaterally. Again, treatment for this is gonna be, number one is always gonna be descent. You can also give nifedipine and supplemental oxygen. For high altitude cerebral edema, least common but most severe, begins with a headache, but then can have pr rapidly progressing neurologic symptoms. Um, typically seen above 14,000 feet. Um, the most sensitive finding you're going to see in the earliest finding is going to be at ataxia. Again, for the exam, loves to ask these questions for high altitude cerebral edema. The most sensitive finding in the earliest finding is going to be ataxia. The best treatment is going to be for descent. You can also give decadron, and you can also consider hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Hypothermia. Um, so these are your Osborne J waves. Um, there's three different levels of hypothermia you should know about. So mild hypothermia, which is when the patient's uh, temperature is like in the 90 to 95 range or 32 to 35 degrees, um, will present with shivering and mild confusion and elevated symptoms, tachycardia, blood pressure, respiratory rate. Moderate hypothermia, 86 to 90 degrees or 30 to 32 degrees, um, will have no shivering. And sometimes this will be an ITE question. It's definitely on Rosh Review. will have your patient who has hypothermia, but they're presenting without shivering, what type of hypothermic response are they having, mild, moderate, or severe? That would be moderate. Moderate hypothermia does not present with shivering. Um, but that's when you start seeing Osborne J waves if they have moderate hypothermia. Severe hypothermia, and this reason to know that these J waves on exam is it can cause dysrhythmias, bradycardia, slow AFib, and eventually can lead to VF and uh, asystole. Uh, this is just another ECG showing the Osborne J waves here. 
Um, and I just wanted to touch back on one thing too, um, for hypothermia, coagulopathy is very common. You may not have actual lab abnormality of coagulopathy. So you have a normal PT, PTT and INR, you have a functional coagulopathy. So the enzymes in the cl clotting cascade will not actually work when it's too cold. Sometimes maybe an ITE question, always just like to throw that out there as well. Frostbite. Okay. So clinically differentiating between frostbite and frost nip um, is just the formation of ice and tissue loss. Here, very obvious that there's tissue loss. Um, so this would be classified as frostbite. On the exam, they may sometimes ask you what's the clinical, what's a differentiating factor. It is ice formation within the tissues. If there is ice formation within the tissues, that is frostbite. If there is no ice formation within the tissues, that is frost nip. Um, phase one of frostbite is the actual freeze. So ice forms within the extracellular and extra, intracellular space causing cell death. Phase two is the reperfusion injury, rewarms the arachidonic acid cascade begins uh, uh, to leak from damaged endothelium causing prostaglandin and TXA release. And this causes leaky capillaries, edema, blisters, and, whoop, and eventually this dry gangrene. Treatment is always rapid rewarming re and you always wanna avoid refreeze after thaw. Refreeze can cause increased tissue destruction. This is why sometimes folks, especially those who are undomiciled, will get admitted for frostbite treatment because they have a high risk of refreezing because they cannot reliably uh, stay out of the cold. So again, and this is the time of year you're going to see this clinically as well. Um, you can debreed blisters. You want to leave hemorrhagic ones intact. That's a key uh, point for the exam. And always update Tdap for any sort of frost-related injuries. Heat-related injuries. So heat exhaustion. Um, heat stress, heat exhaustion is simply discomfort because it's hot. So, you know, I know the prostrations listed here, but folks who come in, they're feeling wiped out or run down, but they have no overt neuro findings. That is heat exhaustion. If they have overt neuro findings, that is going to be heat stroke. Who do you classically see this in? Elderly folks. And it's non-exertional heat stroke. These are the folks who are going to be sitting in the 9,000 degree apartment in the middle of the summer because they're so old, they've lost their temperature regulation. This is really critical to get this information from EMS on the ITE. That's how it's going to be related. Um, you're going to see heat stroke in the young, typically in an athlete. The treatment for both is rapid cooling with misting and with fans. All right, we're entering into the last portion here, H-E-E-N-T. Uh, So quick high yield things to know for trauma to the eye. The weakest point is going to be the orbital floor. Um, on x-ray, you can see a teardrop sign. Um, they like to ask about x-rays on the exam for facial trauma because they know clinically everybody gets a CT max face. So again, for orbital floor fracture, you're going to see a teardrop sign on x-ray. For retrobulbar hemorrhage, just know for that you're going to be doing a lateral canthotomy. For alkali burn, you're going to want to irrigate copiously with water. And for acidic burns, they're less destructive. These are common questions that are asked on the IT in regards to eye trauma, which is why it's its own dedicated slide. So orbital floor fracture, uh, typically seen in a blowout. What's a blowout fracture? So it's when the orbital floor itself is fractured. It's pointing here. Um, we've seen this all uh, probably clinically is one of the most common fractures we'll see. In, uh, we'll see again, they know that we like to get CTs on everybody. So they always like to ask, what is the best x-ray view to evaluate for an orbital uh, floor fracture? It's going to be the water's view on x-ray. Any structures to clinically worry about on exam for orbital floor fracture is the nerve so and the muscle. So the inferior rectus muscle and the inferior oblique muscles can sometimes get entrapped. So this will manifest clinically as diplopia with upward gaze. So when they're looking upwards, either the eye actually physically won't move up or sometimes in very subtle um, entrapment of the inferior rectus and inferior oblique muscle, they're just going to endorse diplopia when they're looking upwards. Hyphema. Um, traumatic hyphema can be seen, obviously, with uh, any sort of ocular injury, but you can also get this spontaneously. Um, clinically, things to know and things to know for the exam. Always check coags for this because you can have spontaneous hyphema, folks, especially in sickle cell disease. Hyphema can also lay out posteriorly. So you're gonna to wanna to have the patient sit up, head of bed at least greater than 30 degrees. Treatment of this. So if, if it's less than one third of the eye, even in traumatic hyphema, that's general, that's outpatient opto follow-up. And you're gonna to wanna to give them the following recommendations, which is keep the head of the bed above 45 degrees for about a week. Sometimes opto will discharge these folks with oral TXA or oral aminocaproic acid. There's generally not something we'll do as ER doctors directly right off the bat, usually in conjunction with ophthalmology. If they have a hyphema greater than one third of the eye, 
So this one's obviously a very small hyphema, less than one third of the eye. If it's greater than one third of the eye, that's when you wanna have inpatient ophthalmic evaluation and consider admission just because they're a high risk for uh, both rebleed as well as high risk of vision loss. These patients, you always want to let them know within three to five days, that's the highest risk of spontaneous rebleeding. So if they do have any rebleeding or they see any rebleeding, uh, either visually or they notice decreased visual acuity to re return to the ED. For hyphema, you do want to use an eye shield. And just a quick word on eye shields, there's only two indications for eye shields in the emergency department hyphema and the globe rupture. Again, I want to emphasize, especially for the exam, but also clinically, two indications for eye shields, hyphema and globe rupture. Otherwise, don't use eye shields. So corneal abrasions, I have some pictures coming up. Um, hot topic because ASEP just came out saying you can use topical anesthetic drops. For the exam, don't use topical anesthetic drops. And the rationale behind that is, and generally, I usually do not prescribe these because it can mask worsening injury and infection. If it's a normal human being that knows how to return to the emergency department, you can give them top, topical anesthetic drops, but most folks are not. Um, contact lens users, things you want to know if they have a corneal ulcer is that it's pseudomonas. Um, and then you always want to be concerned for perforation. You'll see a teardrop-shaped pupil and have a positive Seidel sign. Um, this is the type of image, for those of you who have not taken the ITE, the low quality image that you're going to see on the exam. The ITE loves to give you super low quality image. And the reason I include this one in here is I remember thinking, oh, this is just reflection of whatever light they used for the corneal ulcer. No, this is the corneal ulcer they're trying to show you on an exam. It's going to be a very faint white spot. Again, if you have someone who has a, a contact lens user, user, you're going to want to think pseudomonas. Um, just a word about penetrating trauma and globe rupture. You're gonna see severe conjunctival hemorrhage, hyphema, and then you may have a teardrop shaped pupil with Seidel sign. If you have Seidel sign, globe injury is suspected. Do not manipulate or touch the globe anymore. Definitely do not check uh, uh, intraocular pressures. This is what a positive Seidel sign looks like. Corneal ulcers, if you see this type of ulceration or this type of laceration, this one makes you want to think of a lid foreign body. Um, typically, you're going to see these in folks who work with metals, so welders, construction workers, um, and it may just be a foreign body that's lashed uh, onto the uh, under part of the lid. So you just want to flick the lid up clinically on exam and uh, remove whatever foreign body it is. But this is very typical of a lid retained foreign body as it's scratching the lid as the patient is blinking. Differentiating between conjunctivitis and iritis. Very important clinically, and also just a lovely question to get on the exam. They love to test this one. So uh, conjunctivitis, most cases are viral and predominantly associated with adenovirus. Viral conjunctivitis produces a very watery discharge that classically starts in one eye and spreads to the other. You're going to see preauricular lymphadenopathy, in particular with adenovirus. And treatment for this is just warm complex compresses. Bacterial conjunctivitis is suspected if you're having purulent discharge. If you're having hyperpurulent discharge and hyperpurulent gonorrhea discharge is truly just like pouring pus out of the eye, um, that's when you're going to want to think gonorrhea. If you just have purulent discharge or you have purulent um, um, when the eyes are shut together and you do have a little bit of a pus as they're separating, that's when you want to think more so bacterial. Um, you can discharge on topical antibiotics, um, which have been shown to decrease duration of symptoms, but not necessarily necessary. For iritis, which we'll get to in a second, I always just want to show this picture. So this is um, like allergic conjunctivitis here. So see how erythematous it is. Um, the iris is fine. For iritis, which is also called anterior uveitis, can be both infectious, post-traumatic, or not really both, but three things, and autoimmune disease. Typically, patients present with actual eye pain, tearing, and direct and consensual photophobia. Patients with conjunctivitis typically do not present with pain, but eye irritation. It's very important to try to flush that out clinically on exam because the treatment for both is very different. And you know, I, until I did my optho rotation, I did not realize how much we clinically miss iritis in the ED. This is someone, if I'm suspecting, I actually will whip out, whip out the ophthalmoscope and look for anterior cells and flare. That's one of the big signs that you'll see clinically on exam. You may also get a misshapen pupil, which you're seeing here, which leads you more towards iritis as opposed to conjunctivitis. So again, you have a lot of subconjunctival uh, uh, con congestion here, which may make you think conjunctivitis, but what leads you towards iritis clinically on the exam is the misshapen pupil. Again, the ITE loves to just show you an image and will just ask you what is the most likely clinical diagnosis. If you see this, the reason again, it's iritis is because of the misshapen pupil. 
preceptal or periorbital cellulitis. Uh, again, the exam likes to give you things that um, can be one of two etiologies. So preceptal versus septal uh, cellulitis or periorbital versus orbital cellulitis. So preceptal cellulitis, the eye itself is not involved. Patients have full extraocular movement. They have normal acuity and they don't have eye pain. They're typically coming in with just swelling and erythema around the eye. And this is usually related to staph, group A strep, or H flu in the in or in the non uh, immuma in blah, blah, blah. people who don't have vaccines, they get H flu. Septal or orbital cellulitis, these patients present quite sick, uh, proptosis, pain with extraocular movements, usually staph. And the folks with diabetes and immune compromise, you want to think mucor. I actually have had a mucor. Uh, orbital cellulitis that I've admitted to the hospital before. It is a thing you'll see. Another clinical pearl to think about in folks who have really severe orbital cellulitis or that you're concerned for with all these findings, proptosis, pain with extraocular movements. You also want to think of uh, cerebral venous thrombosis. So typically for these folks, I'm, I'm getting a CT scan, not just of the max face with IV contrast, but a CTV as well. And you'll be surprised. Uh, the two of them are pretty concomitant. Um, I did touch on this a little bit earlier, uh, herpes keratitis as opposed to disseminated zoster. Um, again, herpes keratitis, you're going to see these dendritic lesions on the eye, but should not have skin involvement. Folks who have skin involvement, that's disseminated zoster because it includes both the eye and the surrounding skin. Hutchinson's sign is when you're seeing lesions on the nose. I forget the name of the one that you're going to see uh, with lesions on the ear, but that's also another one to think of. If you're suspecting herpes keratitis, or if you see clinical signs of herpes keratitis, you always need to look in the nose and look in the ear to rule out clinically disseminated zoster and always inform the patient that they could have uh, to be wary of lesions appearing on the nose or pain within the ear as that could be the only and early signs of disseminated zoster. I didn't know the arrow was gonna point there, but that's the patient's nose. This is a good slide to screenshot. Things that cause sudden vision loss that will come across your desk in the emergency department and also on the exam. Sudden vision loss associated with halos, you're going to want to think glaucoma, in particular acute angle closure glaucoma. Sudden vision loss associated with a curtain coming down is retinal detachment. Transient vision loss that is painless, you want to think of amaurosis. Sudden painless vision loss, you're going to want to think of central retinal artery occlusion and central retinal vein occlusion. Clinically, there is no way to differentiate these without doing an opto exam, and I'll show you a picture in a second. But as far as the clinical story that you can't differentiate this, but they're going to have both sudden and painless vision loss. Vision loss associated with floaters is typical of vitreous hemorrhage, and vision loss associated with scalp pain or temporal headache is temporal arteritis. So on the left, you're going to see central retinal artery occlusion. On the right, you're going to see central retinal vein occlusion. You can see these with a non-dilated uh, eye. So I always recommend folks to do your own ophthalmoscope exams, especially if you're going to a non-academic center once you leave this ED. You can see these things with a non-dilated and compliant patient on exam with a dark room. On the left, central retinal artery occlusion, you're going to see a pale retina due to retinal edema. You're going to see what's called box carring of the uh, retinal arteries. So they sort of get thicker and sort of this uh, box car appearance, not very, very well visualized um, in this image. And then this cherry red spot, how you can see it's a little bit more erythematous over here uh, in the area of the macula. In comparison with a central ve retinal vein occlusion, you get what's called the blood and thunder appearance or these cotton wool spots from retinal hemorrhages. As you can notice here, the retina and the macula itself is nice and bright. This is more typical of a central retinal vein occlusion and on the left is central retinal artery occlusion. Again, on the exam, you sometimes may just get a picture of this and I'll ask you what the etiology is um, or ask you what the treatment is for these. So just know these images and I'll send out actually a thing to everybody too. I have a, a thing of high yield images for the ITE. All right, acute angle acute angle closure glaucoma. Uh, painful red eye that's worsened when placed in a dim or dark room um, can mimic acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. And what that means is patients will come in with the worst headache of their life. It'll be an ocular headache and sometimes will be associated with vision loss. On the exam, what they always like to say is the patient is placed in a dim room with worsening eye pain. That should lead you towards acute angle glaucoma. glaucoma. Again, another common scenario is the patient uh, started having some eye pain, goes in to see a movie, uh, and in the movie has worsening eye pain, decided to come to the ED. That's another thing for acute angle glaucoma. On exam clinically, they're going to have what's called a steamy cornea. Sounds like a very dirty thing, uh, but you're just going to see the steamed out uh, cornea on exam. And it's going to be a fixed dilated pupil. 
Um, don't sit on these. I remember when I was a PGY2, an off-service resident did that um, because they're not, you know, sometimes not trained in obviously finding these things, but these are an acute emergency. Um, you're going to want to measure the intraocular pressure. Remember, normal IOP is going to be 10 to 20. Theirs is going to be through the roof, 30s, 40s, sometimes 50s. Um, the treatment uh, for acute angle glaucoma is a uh, topical beta blocker, timolol, uh, topical um, alpha agonist, so a prep apraclonidine, acetazolamide, and then you can also give pilocarpine and an optoconsult. Um, you can give Banatol. I have never given Banatol clinically for these, although it's been suggested. Uh, typically, most respond very well to just topical drops. Um, foreign bodies in the nose. If you have foul smelling discharge in a toddler without a clear etiology, you're always going to want to suspect foreign body. And then if you have persistent nasal bleeding with or without trauma, oops, but generally with trauma, you want to consider a CSF leak. The most common uh, facial, oh, most common cause of trauma, blah, blah. the most common facial fracture in trauma is a nasal fracture. Um, things to know, you do not need an x-ray or any imaging if a patient has a suspected broken nose. Again, I wanna emphasize this for the test because clinically this may be different than what most folks are used to. You do not need imaging if you're suspecting just a broken nose clinically on exam. What you need to know though is for septal hematoma. So septal hematoma is associated with necrosis of the septum, especially if it's left untreated. These typically do not present acutely. So septal hematomas typically present within 24 hours of injury. It's always important to take a look up the schnoz if someone's coming in with nasal injury because they can have an early developing septal hematoma. But again, these typically present within 12 to 24 hours of injury, not necessarily in the hyperacute state. Um, big thing to know is it can cause avascular necrosis and saddle deformity of the nose, which is why it's treated. It's mostly for aesthetic reasons, um, but it may be described as a blue sac that's seen when looking up on, uh, on a nasaloscopy. Nosebleed. Um, anterior nosebleeds are much more common than posterior ones. 90% of anterior nosebleeds are localized to Kisselbach's plexus, um, where three primary uh, vessels and astomos. Um, you can use all these following things, chemical cautery, gauze, or tampon packing. Um, if you're packing with tampons for an na uh, anterior nosebleed, you're going to want to give antibiotics to prevent toxic, cho shock, uh, toxic shock syndrome. For posterior nosebleeds, uh, they can result in significant hemorrhage. Um, these patients do require consultation with ENT and sometimes admission to the hospital for observation. We all know sphenopalatine uh, uh, arteries involved, and I always like to remember that I'm a big Star Wars guy. Uh, Palpatine, so I say sphenopalpatine artery, he's a bad dude, um, and bad dude causes posterior nasal bleeds. Um, these are going to want to use the longer balloons for packing. How do you clinically suspect a nose uh, posterior nasal bleed? If you see on oropharyngeal exam, so it's very hard to see posterior nasal bleed on nasal exam, on oropharyngeal exam, if you see brisk posterior bleeding down the oropharynx, which is how it may be described on the ITE, then you wanna suspect a posterior nasal bleed. These you're gonna immediately pack with a long balloon um, or, or you can use a Foley as well. Um, but these definitely need uh, admission both for uh, serial uh, CBC in some cases, antibiotics, and then serial ENT exam. All right, uh, to the ears. Otitis externa, also known as swimmer's ear. Uh, trauma from excessive cleaning can also cause this that can create micro abrasions and allow organisms to enter. Um, the most common pathogen is pseudomonas followed by staph epidermitis. So treatment is topical antibiotics with the steroids. So Ciprodex, you can also use a, a cortisporin suspension. So neomycin and hydrocort, uh, but generally most folks treat with Ciprodex. I have a picture of some really gnarly acute uh, otitis externa. Other thing to think about too is malignant otitis externa or necrotizing otitis externa. The exam loves to test this and the typical way you're gonna see this is a patient with typically uncontrolled diabetes or some sort of immune compromise. So they may be you know, a cancer patient on active chemotherapy um, and very mild things. You know, They you know, wear earphones and believe it or not, that can be a thing like inner ear earphones that can be a nidus of infection. And they come in with a really gnarly looking external ear infection and uh, necrotizing skin changes within the ear and sometimes externally to the ear. The most common pathogen is pseudomonas. This requires admission for IV antibiotics, sometimes may require IV antibiotics up to six to eight weeks. Again, just know that malignant otitis externa can exist. Clinically on the exam, they're just gonna ask you to identify it and it's typically gonna be in a patient with uncontrolled diabetes or some element of immune compromise. And just know it's pseudomonas is the most common cause. Inner ear, uh, otitis media, the most common cause is gonna be strep pneumo. 
Um, we see this a lot uh, clinically in kids. So they don't like to ask questions about what sort of antibiotic treatment, even though it's amoxicillin. So they're going to ask you things like, what's the most common complication? Most common complication of otitis media is hearing loss. You can remember me. I'm partially deaf in my left ear because I had otitis media. So think of me when you see otitis media, most common complication is going to be hearing loss. Other complications to consider in untreated otitis media. So untreated otitis media, especially is going to be an adult who comes to the hospital with like a week or so of left ear pain or right ear pain. I don't know why I chose left. Um, you're going to want to think mastoiditis. Acute mastoiditis is most commonly caused by strep pneumo. Chronic mastoiditis is caused by pseudomonas. That's what the test is going to ask you. Acute mastoiditis is caused by strep pneumo. Chronic mastoiditis is caused by pseudomonas. Um, inner ear will cover when we get to the neurology section later today. Um, for mouth, um, most common dental emergency or most common mouth emergency is going to be a dental abscess or caries. Uh, most important thing to be concerned about is airway compromise. Things to know for the exam, an avulsed tooth needs to be implanted within 30 minutes. You can place it in milk, have the patient place it in their cheek, in their own saliva if they are trustworthy and you don't think they're going to swallow their own tooth. And then Hank's solution is the most preferred. Um, we're getting a couple more slides. We're almost there. Um, Acute necrotizing uh, ulcerative gingivitis, or what's known as trench mouth, what's also known as Vincent's angina, is associated with acute onset of fetid breath, blunting of the interdental papilla, um, which you can't really see here, but, you know, so swelling of the gingiva. Um, it's typically a my polymicrobial infection with anaerobes. Risk factors include really folks who are immunosuppressed, really bad oral hygiene, and those who are smokers. Uh, these folks generally need to be admitted for irrigation, debridement, uh, and IV antibiotics. The preferred antibiotic is metronidazole in folks who have systemic signs of illness. So again, in folks who have systemic signs of illness, they get IV antibiotics, which is metronidazole, um, and you also use warm compresses for these. Um, Ludwig's angina, polymicrobial cellulitis of the submandibular space may be described as a ruddy angina uh, underneath the mouth here. They may see elevation of the floor of the submandibular space or floor of the mouth. Um, lymphad lymphadenopathy is typically absent in these folks, and treatment for this is mission for airway monitoring and broad-spectrum antibiotics. Uh, threatened airway in a child, things to know about clinically, you want to see, you're going to see drooling or strider. Um, don't worry about getting an x-ray, treat these patients clinically just to watch the airway. Um, think about epiglottitis in folks who have rapid airway loss. Um, I'm going to show some images to find the hyoid on x-ray. And for retropharyngeal abscess, things to know is most commonly caused by staph and shrep, and you have a widened retropharyngeal airspace. So here's an example of a widened retropharyngeal airspace seen in RPA. In epiglottitis, you have what's called thumbprint sign. Here's the hyoid, and then you have the thumbprint sign right afterwards here. I have another image here that I included, especially for RPA. You want to sort of remember this mnemonic, six at two and 22 at six. So six soft tissue swelling more than six millimeters at C2 and more than 22 millimeters at C6 makes you want to think of an RPA. Uh, Lafort fractures, just know how to recognize them. Um, you know, Lafort one, Lafort two, Lafort three is the way I was classically taught. Um, one involves the hard palate, so free floating, free floating alveolar processes. Two extends to the orbital floors. These can, these can be um, one-sided or, or both sides. This involves the zycoma and leads to craniofacial disruption. And then three is complete craniofacial dissociation. You need to be very suspicious of CSF uh, injuries or intracranial extension with a type two and type three injury. Tripod fractures, um, just to know about, this is essentially just the zygoma gets totally uh, separated from the face. This is one of the most common uh, fractures you'll see in facial trauma, can present with diplopia as well as some numbness along the lower lip and the eye. Um, these are treated symptomatically and can be discharged with outpatient ENT follow-up. Epiglottitis in the newborn, just know this can present with sore throat, dysphagia, drooling, um, very similar presentation, sometimes very difficult to clinically represent from retro, uh, peritonsillar abscess or RPA. Um, diagnosis is generally the thumbprint sign. These patients go to OR for intubation. Foreign bodies and kids, uh, mainstay is paroxysmal cough, wheezing, dec decreased breath sounds on one side. X-ray may show hyperinflation of one lung as opposed to another. And these are typically seen with kids laying on both sides. So you may get two X-ray images on the exam. One shows on the dependent portion, a hyperinflated lung that is uh, larger than the one that's on the non-dependent portion. So again, hyperinflation is the key sign you're looking for there. You can see mediastinal shift as well. Uh, croup, the treatment is racemic epinephrine. You observe for two to three hours. You give PO or parental steroids. What you can see on the exam is this um, steeple sign for croup. 
second to last slide here. So gingival stomatitis, so herpes simplex. So herpes simplex causes uh, anterior gingival stomatitis. So this is what you have the lip and cheek involvement for posterior is Coxsackie or herpangina. Um, for bacterial tracheitis can be a life-threatening sequelae of those things. Um, when a child has viral pharyngitis or any sort of these things, they come in, they're very ill-appearing. They may have a story of like croup or some sort of rash on the mouth. These are folks who, again, need emergent intubation either in the OR or down here in the ED. And just know for the exam, for bacterial tracheitis, it's going to be a toxic kid with a story of either croup or some sort of gingivus stomatitis comes in needing emergent intubation. The question they're going to ask you is what antibiotic to choose choose nafcillin or ceftriaxone. All right, everybody. Thanks for your tolerating this uh, slideshow of rapid stuff. Um, feel free to take a five minute break. We'll return at 10.06 for the next one. Should we, let's um let's just keep going and then right, after the next one, we'll take a 10, break. 10.05 yeah. is fine. Just a little, 10.05 is okay. Mm -hmm. Bio. Um, for anyone who hasn't met me before, I'm Janelle Lambert, I'm one of the Cornell APDs. Um, now I have the most slides, so we're going to go rapidly through these. Um, starting off with some blood transfusions in our hematology section. Um, main thing to know is that one unit of packed red blood cells, uh, that's about 250 milliliters, raises hemoglobin by one uh, gram per deciliter, while a unit of platelets, uh, which is about 50 ml, so a fifth of a unit of packed red blood cells, raises uh, platelets by uh, five to 10,000. Um, it can sometimes be confusing when you're ordering this yourself and you'll sometimes hear about a pool or a pack of platelets. That's usually five units, which you can remember as being the same volume as packed red blood cells, so 250 milliliters. Autotransfusion, uh, which is when the patient receives their own blood back. Um, you won't have any functional platelets or fibrinogen, uh, like so no plasma or clotting factors as well due to how the blood is processed on the way back in. Um, and as we all know, the universal donor here is O negative. Uh, next, in terms of fresh frozen plasma, um, each CC contains one unit of each clotting factor. Clotting factors in fresh frozen plasma are, there's a large number of them, that's two, five, seven, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Um, so that's a big chunk of your coagulation cascade. Uh, in terms of reactions for transfusions, the most common reaction you're going to have um, is a febrile reaction. This is a febrile non-hemolytic reaction, and that's due to interaction of the recipient and donor non-RBC components. However, the most serious is going to be a hemolytic um, reaction. This is actually usually related to a clerical error because it's incompatible RBCs that have been transfused. Uh, this is going to look sometimes like sepsis and then sepsis septic shock. So you're going to have fever, chills, dyspnea, dark urine, nausea, vomiting. Uh, that can lead to um, hypotension, bleeding, and respiratory failure. Uh, at this point, due to how well we do processing and screening, disease transmission is actually quite low risk at this point, um, which is uh, great at this point in time. Um, and so moving on to bleeding disorders, um, iatrogenically, um, warfarin, obviously we're using this for a lot of patients. Uh, warfarin is an inhibitor of vitamin K. Um, and vitamin K is needed to produce uh, the factors um, 10, 9, 8, and 2. So that's uh, the way to remember that. 1972, you'll have to remember that one stands for 10. Um, but as well, uh, it's going to inhibit uh, proteins C and S. If you need to reverse uh, warfarin, um, FFP uh, has historically been used for rapid reversal. However, now we also have four-factor PCC. Um, AKA K Centra. And that has these four factors. So 10, 9, 8, and 2, um, excuse me, 7 and 2, um, which is also an option for rapid reversal. Vitamin K, we use kind of in that moderate need for something for reversal, and that takes a little bit longer. Uh, heparin, another thing that we give that binds uh, antithrombin 3. Um, as you know, one of its main positives is that it has a short half-life. And so if there is bleeding, you can quickly just stop your heparin uh, infusion and that will wash out. Um, if you do need to give something as an antidote, uh, protamine, one mg uh, per 100 units um, that has, was just infusion, 
infusing is what you can give in that case. Now, in terms of diseases, uh, of course, the classic thing that you're going to hear about testing wise is hemophilia. Uh, and so the main one that we talk about the most is type A hemophilia. In this case, uh, it's going to be abnormal function of factor eight. Um, in this case, you're going to have potentially a prolonged um, APTT, um, if you can remember the coagulation pathway uh, cascade. Um, factor eight is part of the uh, intrinsic pathway, uh, and so that's why PT and are going to be normal, and it's just going to be an APTT that's abnormal. You can give uh, DDAVP or desmopressin for mild bleeding, and this promotes release of your endogenous factor eight. Um, however, you are going to have to uh, potentially give um, recombinant factor eight or cryoprecipitate, which includes uh, factor eight, uh, von Willebrand factor, and fibrinogen, um, if you're having more significant bleeding. Um, something that you'll see a lot on kind of Rosh review questions and does occasionally come up um, is that uh, what amount of uh, factor eight uh, you're going to have to give depending on what kind of bleeding you're having. Um, and so this is all derived from the fact that each unit per kilogram of uh, factor increases your factor level by 2%. And so for a minor bleed, um, you uh, that's sometimes kind of like early joint or minor kind of intramuscular bleeding. Um, you're trying to get your factor up 20 to 30%. And so somewhere around 15 units per kg, again, each uh, unit raises factor by 2% is what you're going to want to give. For moderate bleeding, um, which includes something like epistaxis um, and a little bit uh, more joint uh, bleeding, for example, uh, you want to get to 50% activity, so often around 25 units per kg is the ballpark. ballpark. Now, major bleeding, that's going to be your abdominal, your retroperitoneal, major trauma or surgery, or intracranial bleeding. You want to try to get up to 100% um, factor level. And so 50 units per kg is what you're going to need. Uh, hemophilia B is our less common uh, one that we talk about. And that's instead factor nine deficiency. Uh, similarly to hemophilia, you're going to have to uh, give extra factor in, this, in the sense of bleeding, factor nine. Um, and there are different um, kind of doses depending on how much bleeding you're having. Uh, DIC, um, this is obviously a major bleeding disorder where you're having deregulation and widespread activation of the coagulation and fibrolytic uh, pathways. Um, the kind of buzzword or, or, or phrase that you'll hear is a consumptive coagulopathy. Um, and in this case, in terms of your lab values, you're going to have wide derangements in kind of your blood uh, and your um, and coags. Um, and so your PT and APTT, again, it's widespread for the whole coagulation pathway. And so that's all going to be prolonged. Uh, meanwhile, you're consuming platelets and fibrinogen, so that will be lower. And with D-dimer, it's going to be elevated. The treatment truly is actually more treating the underlying cause, um, but then you're going to need supportive care in the sense of if you're bleeding, they're going to need blood products. So that's going to be RBCs, platelets, FFP. Um, but you're also at risk for microvascular thrombosis. And so you may need uh, heparin because of that increased risk. ITP, um, formerly known as idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, now immune. Um, this is uh, increased uh, platelet clearance by the reticuloendothelial system. Um, often uh, what you'll see is that this is... Um, after uh, some kind of viral infection. Um, the acute treatment um, for adults is steroids. Uh, that's usually specifically is there if there is some sort of bleeding with platelets less than 50 um, or if platelets are less than about 10 to 30, uh, you'll just give it anyway. Uh, for adults, it's plus or minus IV, IG as well. But in children, you're gonna avoid steroids and um, preferred first line is IV, IG. Uh, next is TTP, uh, which is kind of the more dangerous of the two, uh, and that's thrombotic thermocytopenic purpura. 
Uh, the kind of classic pentad you'll hear about in 40% is thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, um, uh, neurologic kind of dysfunction, uh, ultramentocytis, uh, renal disease, and a fever. Um, something that you can think is that if you see uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia plus thrombocytopenia, it's pretty much TTP until proven otherwise. In this case, there is platelet consumption, and so there's no point in doing platelet transfusion. Instead, the um, the treatment of choice is plasmapheresis, aka a plasma exchange transfusion. Um, this is more common in adults um, than kids. Uh, in kids, your so a similar presentation is pretty much going to be HUS. Next, von Willebrand disease. Uh, this is actually the most common inherited bleeding disorder. In this case, there is dysfunction of the von Willebrand factor. And so what we're going to see is actually more prolonged bleeding time um, and not necessarily as much issues with your coags. Um, you may be able to see a prolonged APTT um, because von Willebrand uh, factor helps uh, with factor eight's half-life. Uh, and so that may be where you see an effect. Um, the main way uh, to uh, help treat this uh, is with DDAVP as well. Again, uh, it helps release endogenous von Willebrand factor, uh, kind of much like how it works with hemophilia. Uh, if you do need more factor for serious bleeding, again, just like hemophilia, there are von Willebrand factor concentrates uh, that can be dosed. Um, in terms of uh, anemia and deficiencies there, the most common enzyme defect is um, G6PD deficiency. Uh, and so what you're going to see there is you're going to see some hem uh, hemolytic anemia after oxidative stress. Uh, and so that's the very typical um, testing is going to be after infection, fava beans, meds. The most common meds you can think of are sulfas like Bactrim, antimalarials, Dapsone, uh, Commonly tested is going to be kind of what descent, African descent, Asian, and Mediterranean descent are most common. Um, as I mentioned, that's similar to TTP. Hemoglobinuremic syndrome um, uh, is usually in kids um, and usually related to um, E. coli, uh, enterohemorrhagic E. coli. And so the question stem might say something like a kid eating some undercooked meat who's having diarrhea um, and that can likely lead to uh, HUS. Um, you avoid antibiotics in these kids because that can increase your risk of HUS. Uh, sickle cell disease. Um, obviously, we treat a lot of patients with sickle cell disease, so we're more, more aware of this. Um, things to note, in a vasoocclusive crisis, um, it's due to what symptoms you're having. Labs are not really indicative of, of anything in terms of treatment. Um, for vasoocclusive crisis, it is usually hemolytic. Um, and so because of that, your hematocrit fails, but reticulocytes rise as you try to um, produce the RBCs that you're losing. Um, a problem is uh, sequestration. And so you'll see a large uh, spleen in uh, kids and often many adults will be functionally um, asplenic. Um, one commonly tested um, kind of complication is going to be a plastic um, kind of uh, crisis. And that's where you're having bone marrow failure. Um, that's often related to having a parvovirus, um, uh, a parvovirus infection. That's the one where it's a slapped uh, cheek uh, with the, the reddened um, rash. In this case, because there's bone marrow failure, the hematocrit falls, but also reticulocytes fall because you're not able to produce um, anything in response to this um, uh, decrease in your hematocrit. Um, next, we're going to talk a little bit about leukemia um, in terms of white blood cells. And so a blast crisis, uh, that might often be the reason you would kind of see someone come to the ED. There's going to be a flu-like uh, kind of symptoms with the predominance of immature cells. Um, a leukemoid reaction uh, in the setting of an infection resembles leukemia in the sense that you have a, a significantly elevated WBC count. Um, and specifically, I mean, this is in general with cancer, um, but neutropenia is a main concern here, um, as we all know with how much we care about uh, neutropenic fever, which is a fever with an ANC less than 500. 
uh, infection is actually the leading cause of cancer death. And so neutropenia and neutropenic fever uh, need to be quickly treated um, with antibiotics uh, as soon as possible. Um, next, we're going to talk about multiple myeloma. Um, this is a uh, plasma cell malignancy. Um, the In terms of the symptoms, one of the common mnemonics you're going to hear is CRAB, uh, and that relates to hypercalcemia, uh, which is in 30%, uh, renal failure, anemia, as well as bone lesions or back pain. Uh, the lesions you'll commonly see if you have an image, for example, are these, quote, punched out lesions, uh, and those are lytic lesions. Uh, Infection, again, is the most common cause of death. Uh, and so uh, because you're going to have neutropenia and hypogammaglobinemia. Um, one thing that can happen in hyper, in a, excuse me, multiple myeloma is hyperviscosity syndrome. Um, and this is where you're going to have symptoms from, from poor capillary flow and organ congestion. So you'll get headaches, altered brain status, dyspnea, blurred vision um, related to the poor capillary flow. You'll sometimes uh, see uh, tumor compressions in cancer. Um, the main ones we know about, of course, spinal cord compression, where you're gonna need steroids and radiation to treat the underlying cause, pericardial tamponade, obviously we're gonna need pericardial synthesis, SVC syndrome, uh, which is usually caused by an extrinsic mass causing compression of the SVC. We'll usually have facial swelling and flushing that's worse in the morning because they were laying flat. Historically, diuretics and steroids have been classical treatment, um, but that's actually become less into favor. More it's symptomatic treatment with keeping the head elevated, elevated ICP, uh, treat elevated, excuse me, ICP, and obviously treat the underlying cause, so with radiation um, and stenting if needed. Um, next, um, some of the major biochemical derangement we'd be concerned about in terms of cancer, um, hypercalcemia, uh, which is primarily going to be treated with significant amounts of IV fluid. Uh, SIADH uh, can often be kind of a, a perineoplastic syndrome. So you're going to do fluid res uh, restriction. Um, again, hyperviscosity syndrome, similar to what I just talked about, as well as adrenal cort uh, cortical insufficiency with hydrocortisone. Um, one thing not mentioned in the slides is tumor lysis syndrome, which is usually after the treatment of aggressive, usually heme malignancies, where there's massive cell death. Um, then you're going to see high uric acids, uh, phosphate, um, high potassium, and low calcium. In this case, aggressive IV fluids as well, as well as corrections of electrolytes. Um, and there's sometimes indications for hemodialysis like, like hypercalcemia, excuse me, hyperkalemia uh, or renal failure. Um, these are a lot of kind of buzzwords. If you have cancer plus constipation, think hypercalcemia. As I've mentioned already, fever, neutropenia fever, and sepsis. Um, hypotension, JVD, we think about tamponade or SVC syndrome. With hypoglycemia or hyponeutremia, we're thinking hypoadrenal. Um, with back pain, we're thinking cord compression. Um, moving on to our immunology section. Um, reactive arthritis is now the preferred term. It was formerly Ryder syndrome. Um, the kind of classic thing that we have here is arthritis, um, as well as uh, non-GC arthritis and conjunctivitis. Um, this is associated with HLA B27, uh, and it's seronegative arthritis. Um, it often presents after some kind of infection. The common thing that's tested is chlamydia or GI bug. Um, and primarily, you just need symptomatic treatment, uh, and so that's going to be something like NSAIDs and physical therapy. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, um, is generally a product for uh, parley or articular, um, symmetric arthritis. You often see it affecting the hands. This is where our boutonniere and swan neck deformities come in. Um, the thing that we're going to see is that we're, they're going to have elevated RF, um, Felty syndrome is a complication where you have RA plus neutropenia plus phenylegaly, um, which can cause serious bacterial infections. Uh, something of note and something that can be tested on for certain is that in the setting of RA, um, patients can have uh, atlantial axial joint instability. Uh, so that's between C1 and C2. And minor trauma can be associated with neurologic damage. And this is one of those cases where you do not want to hyperextend the neck with intubation. Uh, vasculitis, um, 
giant cell temporal arteritis is obviously one of the major ones tested. Um, you're going to see classically this elderly woman with unilateral headaches and vision loss with tenderness at the temple and a high ESR. Um, just give steroids in this case. You don't want to wait for biopsy. And we already talked about HSP. For HIV, actually our most new cases are heterosexual. We know HIV can kind of present as really anything. More commonly, what we're talking about are kind of opportunistic infections. Um, and uh, that's usually when a CD4 count is less than 200. Um, PCP, uh, actually now PJP, is the main kind of pneumonia where you have the bat wing appearance and that's treated with the Bactrim uh, and addition of steroids for very serious cases. Um, the um, anaphylaxis and allergies. Anaphylaxis, as we know, is hypotension, uh, has, uh, is actually an allergic reaction, but now you're having uh, broader um, systemic effects and you'll see uh, hypotension due to capillary leak. First line treatment is always going to be epinephrine, so that get that EpiPen. Otherwise, we're adding on the inhaled beta agonist, H1 and H2 blockers, so diphenhydramine and ranitidine or famotidine with systemic corticosteroids. Uh, in the sense of refractory hypertension, uh, and still you're having recurrence of symptoms, um, you may need pressors here. Um, you may be resistant to epi if you're taking a, a beta blocker, um, and you can give decagon. All right, uh, next we're gonna move on to stomach infectious diseases. Um, gonococcus, um, with local disease, we're gonna have the typical urethritis, cervicitis, epididymitis, minus prostat uh, prostatitis, or PID. If it's disseminated, what we're looking uh, to expect to see is a quote, gun metal gray pustules um, that are tender to the hands, to the skins. You're gonna often have kind of a septic arthritis, tenosynovitis uh, involving multiple joints. Um, what you're gonna see on your stain is uh, our gram negative intracellular uh, diplococci. And so obviously you're gonna treat this primarily with uh, ceftriaxone, um, historically as well as fluoroquinolone. Botulism, uh, this is often in that kind of floppy baby is what you may hear. Um, this is due to blocks in uh, acetylcholine uh, choline release at the neuromuscular junction. Um, this is often foodborne. Uh, what we typically hear is the canned foods, especially um, home done um, or honey. Um, this also has um, kind of bulbar symptoms uh, as well as a descending flaccid paralysis and weakness. Um, but however, reflexes are preserved. Contrast this with the on beret where you have an ascending paralysis and a loss of reflexes. Um, the main thing here is going to be supportive care and respiratory monitoring um, because the most common cause of death here is respiratory failure. Um, if they're over one year old, um, you can do antitoxin. Uh, toxic shock syndrome, um, this became more known kind of in the general public as they were, they were more alert, especially in the setting of tampon use. Um, staph aureus is the most common, um, and this is where you're gonna have that erythematous rash with discrimination, hypotension, high fever. Uh, main thing here, remove the foreign body if there is a foreign body associated with toxic uh, with TSS, um, supportive care, and antibiotics. Um, Plinda often reduces kind of the protein production and then broad spectrum antibiotics. Lyme disease um, is um, the kind of common thing we're seeing is this target lesion, um, erythema migra ECM, erythema chronica migrans. Um, this is uh, carried by the Borrelia burgdorferi, um, and that actually vector that carries it is the deer tick, um, so it is. Um, Often people don't know that they actually got bitten by a tick. So, you know, sometimes you win if you know that, but often you don't, and it's more the rash. A treatment is going to be pretty much doxy most of the time. If there is uh, CNS or cardiac involvement, IV ceftriaxone, um, and in pregnant people and children less than eight, amoxicillin. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in terms of prophylaxis, if a tick is attached greater than 36 hours, um, and prophylaxis can be started within 72 hours of tick removal, then you can do a single dose of doxy. 
Um, Lyme disease presents in stages. Um, and so the first stage is that rash that we know about, usually within the first week. Stage two, um, which is in kind of days to weeks, is when you start having those neurological changes, um, uh, such as the meningioencephalitis, that's the most common. Um, bilateral Bell's palsy is pretty much classic for Lyme. Uh, cardiac changes, uh, a variable AV uh, node uh, block is the most common uh, in terms of cardiac. Stage three is when you start having arthritis, um, encephalopathy, and that's months to years. Again, doxy is a treatment, except for more severe cardiac or neurological manifestations, we use IV ceftriaxone. Uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Uh, in this case, it's rickettsia um, is uh, the actual uh, uh, kind of cause. The vector is the wood tick. Um, you're going to see a fever. It's the most common uh, symptom with malaise, the rash um, that starts um, on the palms and soles and goes centripetally, so towards the trunk. Um, the uh, doxycycline is pretty much always what you're going to give, even in children in this case. Tetanus is uh, due to the clostridium tetanus tetani spores um, that enter the wounds. Um, this truly is a terrible disease because you are fully, like have a normal mental status with intact sensorium, um, but due to the neurotoxin uh, tetanospasmin, you're having blocked um, inhibitory, so GABA firing. And so there's unopposed excitatory firing causing all of these um, side effects, spasms, contractions, uh, trismus, uh, spasticity. Um, Strychnine is pretty much the only mimic of tetanus, strychnine poisoning. Um, and unsurprisingly, given you're fully awake during all of this, you're going to have high catecholamines. So that's elevated BPs, uh, pulses, and uh, temperatures. Um, treatment for tetanus is primarily supportive. So benzos, uh, opioids, plus some paralytics, as well as wound care with debridement um, and antibiotics, primarily metronidazole. In terms of being kind of preventative. Um, Tdap is the main thing. You can add uh, tetanus uh, Ig. Uh, if they're unimmunized or you don't know their status, plus a high risk, high risk wound, um, the wounds considered high risk include greater than 60 hours old, uh, contaminated with dirt, saliva, or feces, um, foreign bodies, puncture, crush, avulsion wounds, or uh, frostbite. Rabies. Um, domestically, it's in cats more than dogs. In developing countries, though, dogs are high risk. In the U.S., it's generally caused by a wild animal. That's about 90% of cases. The most common being bats in the U.S. Um, and then below that are kind of things like raccoons and skunks. Um, Incubation is about three to seven weeks and usually have pain, paresthesia at the site. Uh, classic uh, will be hydrophobia, where dr uh, drinking water causes painful spasms. Um, in terms of rabies, uh, kind of treatment, what you're doing is at the wound, uh, you're given your immune uh, globulin at least half in and around the wound, and then the rest at a site away from where the wound was. And then you're giving your vaccine in your kind of series uh, over the course of the month. All right, moving on to kids uh, and infections. Neonatal sepsis, um, we all know that's less than four weeks. Um, we're starting to get a little bit more bold, uh, especially in that last week, 22 to 28 days, but I wouldn't say that for test purposes at this point. Um, usually that's caused by group B strep, Listeria, E. coli. Um, we know all the kind of symptoms generally not acting right with the fever. You're going to do that broad septic work, work up, blood cultures, urine cultures, LP uh, in this case, and you're going to admit because they're young. Um, antibiotics you're going to give are ampicillin and cefotaxime. You can add uh, acyclovir depending on risk in terms of uh, like HSV and, and something like that. Um, in terms of kids with sickle cell, uh, salmonella is going to be one of your main causes of uh, sepsis. In this like later period, kind of four to eight weeks, uh, it's a little bit more targeted, um, but obviously you have a low threshold to be more aggressive. Um, often we're using clinical decision rules like the criteria, uh, Philadelphia criteria, Boston criteria, and these people can, uh, these kids, excuse me, can be you know dispo home of their low risk, but sometimes it may be high risk as well. Um, Kawasaki disease definitely one of the most tested kind of diseases in kids. Um, 
the kind of main symptom is a fever of at least five days um, and four or of five of the following of uh, conjunctival inject uh, injection, oral mucosal changes, rash, um, extremity kind of changes like hand and foot erythema, um, cervical lymphadenopathy as well. Um, classic in terms of the oral mucosal changes is that lip cracking and quote strawberry tongue. Um, one of the main concerns uh, that you're going to have with Kawasaki disease is the potential um, for uh, coronary artery uh, aneurysm, uh, especially if not treated uh, quickly. Uh, this is one of the few times, pretty much the only time you're going to give high dose aspirin as well as IV, IG. Uh, these people are going to be admitted and they're going to get an echo um, to evaluate for cardiac aneurysms. Um, key viral exanthems to be aware of for testing. Um, Fifth disease, erythema in uh, fixosum in setting parvovirus. I already mentioned that. Slap cheeks and for uh, sickle cell, uh, kids with sickle cell disease, you're going to be worried about an aplastic crisis. Um, roseola, sixth disease, this is going to be HHV6 associated. You're going to start off with a high fever uh, in the beginning, and then you're going to have the rash, a blanching maculopapular rash um, after defibrescence. This is often associated with uh, uh, fever, uh, febrile seizures. Um, I have to make note, it was in the slides, measles, obviously it's, it has been an issue and becoming more of an issue again. Um, this is when you see the three Cs, cough, coryza, conjunctivitis, as well as coplic spots, um, those uh, spots with the white bases in the mouth. Um, and the rash is gonna be macular papillary that starts at the head and goes down to the feet. And varicella um, is one of the other major ones. You're going to see vesicles uh, that are sometimes described as dew drop on a rose petal. That's at the face, then go to the extremities. You're contagious until they get crusted over. Um, this does spare the palms and soles. Uh, <clears throat> um, you can see um, encephalitis. Um, and sometimes you can do a cycle there for immunosuppressed kids who are older than 12. All right, moving on to musculoskeletal. Um, osteomyelitis, again, we see a lot in our population. Uh, most common is staph aureus, even in sickle cell patients, but often you have to think about salmonella once again. Um, if it involved some kind of wound to the feet, you think pseudomonas. After a dog or cat bite, it's going to be pasteurella. Human bite is going to be echinella. Obviously, MRI is the most sensitive test, and you're going to need IV antibiotics. <clears throat> Um, arthritis, it's going to depend on a description of it. Um, if it's septic arthritis, staph aureus is the most common. If it's migratory arthritis that's described, think gonorrhea. One joint, it's probably a septic, but if uh, a few are involved, you can consider gonorrhea, um, Lyme, uh, RA, or that reactive arthritis. Um, multiple joints, more than three, is usually going to be something like autoimmune, like lupus or internal arthritis occasionally viral. Um, treatment of rhabdo, uh, which is a crude necrosis of skeletal muscles and leakage of the cellular contacts into circulation, usually due to trauma, heat, alcohol, drugs, excessive exercise, and they're going to have myalgia, stiffness, weakness, and fevers. Um, ways to kind of tell on an exam and uh, by testing, you're going to have urine positive for um, blood, but no red cells. Um, you're also going to have a CPK that's more than five times the upper limit of normal. Um, you're going to give lots of fluids, uh, like incredibly insane urine output is what you're looking for. Um, and that's to help prevent renal failure. All right, nervous system. Um, and so multiple sclerosis. Um, one of the fluids here for you is going to be that there's multiple presentations of neurosymptoms, but they have different areas of pathology, um, usually with the resolution of the earlier symptoms. And doesn't really quite make sense for any single distribution. Uh, the most common initial symptom in 30% of patients is going to be an optic neuritis. Um, something else that's pretty much almost only kind of mentioned in terms of multiple sclerosis is the bilateral interneuricular um, abdominal plegia. Uh, that's a combined third and sixth nerve palsy. Uh, diplopia is also common. So usually think about eye complaints. 
In terms of headaches, uh, this is a classic target for the classic presentations. Um, and so in a young woman with aura, nausea, or vomiting, that's usually a migraine, uh, cluster headaches uh, where you're going to need just oxygen are usually going to be um, men uh, with more orbital involvement, periodic tension, gradually get worse throughout the day. And obviously a subarachnoid hemorrhage is going to be a sudden onset, thunderclap, worst headache of life um, with vomiting, uh, it's severe, potentially syncope and nausea as well. Um, other headaches, hypertensive headaches often are throbbing and occipital at the back of the head. Um, with meningitis, you're going to have fever and meningismus, um, so neck pain, neck stiffness. Um, if you have an intracranial mass on awakening, it's usually worse uh, as you've been laying flat uh, all night and worse with Valsalvas. Um, Pseudotumor cerebri, which actually is now idiopathic intracranial hypertension, is usually going to be um, in an obese young woman, and you're going to find uh, papilledema uh, on fundoscopy. Glaucoma, um, you're going to often have that kind of unilateral side, vomiting, orbital pain, that cloudy uh, cornea that Mike mentioned, as well as kind of a mid-position pupil. Specifically for subarachnoid hemorrhages, a head CT is highly sensitive uh, less than six hours, um, especially outside of six hours. If you're, it's still suspected and CT is negative, um, standard of care is an LP, where the classic finding is xanthochromia, where there's that yellow tinge um, to the CSF uh, fluid. You want to treat these patients by making sure you're maintaining normal, tensive, uh, normal tension. Um, that often is needed with something like a cardiac drip, but your other antihypertensives that you are commonly know are also um, useful here. Um, nimodipine is to prevent um, vasospasm. Uh, occasionally, you'll be able to see these deep T-wave inversions, often called cerebral T's, um, but that can be seen with other intracranial bleeds as well. This is an example here of that. Um, now, in terms of strokes, um, as we all know, fibrolytic therapy, um, so historically it been TPA, but we recently transitioned to TKN. Um, within the first um, three hours, we're kind of pushing it more to four and a half hours, depending on kind of the, the background and the patient's history. Obviously, you need to have a CT non-con with no blood in it. Um, and again, TPA was bolus with drip. Uh, T and K is now just kind of a, a push. Vertigo, um, we obviously have peripheral and central causes. Um, in terms of peripheral, kind of most important things to note uh, is that it's paroxysmal and intermittent. Uh, it's not kind of a constant thing. Um, you often have nausea with peripheral, um, but usually there's not necessarily kind of CNS signs. In central, um, I still think it can be sudden, uh, but often it's an ill-defined severity. Uh, most important thing to note is that it's constant uh, vertigo uh, or dizziness, and that is the only time when you need the hints when it's constant. Um, and usually uh, CNS signs are gonna be present. Uh, moving on to epidural concerns, epidural abscess, um, Key finding in the history is often IV drug users uh, where there's hematogenous spread. You're going to see uh, fever, back pain, progressive tenderness. You need to make sure you're doing clinically um, a good back exam in, in these patients. Going to be diagnosed on CT or MRI, usually more often MRI, and you're going to need IV antibiotics and neurosurgery uh, to be involved. Uh, moving on to meningitis, uh, pneumococcus is the uh, number one cause in all but neonates um, with a mortality of around 20%. Group B strep is the most common cause in neonates. Um, uh, kind of Neisseria meningitis is common for regional outbreaks. Uh, you think about that new kind of college kid in, in the dorm uh, is what will be described. Um, and Listeria is another kind of major one at the bimodal distribution of neonates as well as uh, the elderly and immunosuppressed. Because what the common, what the cause is often kind of changes by age, uh, the empiric antibiotics we're gonna give also changes. Uh, in neonates, we're thinking ampicillin and cefotaxime. Um, once they're over a month, we can switch that to uh, ceftriaxone. Uh, for that CNS penetration, we consider, continue with the ampicillin, but we add vancomycin. Um, as they get a little bit older, we drop the ampicillin, 
until we go back to when listeria is a common cause um, and they're over 50 and immunocompromised and we add back that ampicillin. Myasthenia gravis um, generally is um, weakness with muscle use. Um, this improves with rest. Uh, often what you're gonna find is uh, ptosis and diplopia. Um, it's usually gonna be proximal muscle weakness and ocular uh, symptoms. Uh, it's pretty rare that you actually have um, respiratory kind of failure. That may be more seen in a myasthenic crisis, which is often triggered by an infection uh, or uh, medications. The main test is gonna be the Tensilon test um, or the ice pack test. Uh, which works uh, by um, uh, seeing an improvement in the symptoms after you apply it. Um, and that's because you inhibit acetylcholinesterase. And so the nicotinic uh, acetylcholine um, receptors um, are going to be able to, to work the way that they're supposed to. 25% of the time, Mycenae gravis is associated with a thymoma. <clears throat> um, Again, respiratory um, failure, especially more in a crisis, is something that you're going to see, which is why we're saying have atropine and to be ready to intubate if necessary. Uh, we already talked about kind of bacterial meningitis in kids, uh, and these are kind of the common causes. <clears throat> uh, seizures in kids. Um, our obviously main concern is often a febrile seizure. Um, and these are in kids six months to five years. It's actually fairly common, uh, up to a third of kids. Um, and the workup is based on kind of what you're finding. There's nothing that you have to do routinely in the setting of febrile seizures. Treatment with benzos um, is going to be necessary. Um, and if it's intractable, consider hyponatremia, INH, or eclampsia. All right, moving on to OB. Um, in terms of PID, we're going to see cervicitis, salpingitis. Um, PID with right pain and jaundice, you think uh, fits you, Curtis. The treatment, however, is exactly the same as with PID. And so you're going to give your IM ceftriaxone as well as your doxycycline. Um, other kind of uh, vulval vaginitis and things that cause that, you have TRIC, uh, which is that strawberry cervix uh, with frothy yellow green discharge. Um, we treat with metronidazole. Um, Gardenella or BV is going to be that fishy odor with flu cells, also metronidazole, while Canada, the yeast infection, um, and that's often going to be fluconazole. Um, and you'll see that cottage cheese discharge on exam. Uh, vaginal bleeding um, most often um, is due to some kind of lesion in the prepubertal age uh, and then pregnancy and reproductive. Um, otherwise kind of perimenopausal, um, uh, it's as um, you're no longer ovulating, but postmenopausal, we think about endometrial lesions and that's kind of a cancer workup. Um, pelvic masses, um, usually kind of some kind of functional cysts in preputable, we get concerned about a germ, a germ cell tumor. Um, you get fibroids, perimenopausal and postmenopausal. Again, we get concerned about a tumor and that's ovarian tumor, ovarian uh, cancer. Um, ultrasound findings uh, when pregnant, um, when you're less than about five weeks, we expect to see a gestational sac. Um, however, remember that for an IUP, you need a gestational sac and a yolk sac. Um, that's uh, about five weeks you start seeing that. We expect to see more in the transvaginal. You start seeing the fetal pole as well as cardiac activity around six weeks. Um, Ectopic pregnancy is going to be one of the main things that we care about or concerned about and tested on. Um, often there's amenorrhea, but sometimes there's vaginal, many times as well, there's vaginal bleeding and of course pain that's lateral uh, to one side, and I'm sudden and sharp. That's uh, kind of classic. And they're going to be kind of watched if you can't identify a topic for um, serum beta, which fails to double in 48 to 72 hours. Um, if there is an adnexal mass um, with free fluid and empty uterus, it is an ectopic uh, until proven otherwise, um, especially if, like I said, there is no yolk sac when you're doing an ultrasound and just see a gestational sac, you need to keep ectopic on differential. Um, discriminatory zone is kind of uh, difficult and hand wavy to be honest, but sometimes often tested is that with transvaginal, 
uh, you would expect to kind of see an IUP with a beta at around 1500, while transabdominal, um, it can range usually around 5,000. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, in terms of maternal death, the most common cause is a PE, uh, medical cause is a PE, but the most common cause overall, um, as you know, women who are pregnant are at significant risk is trauma and homicide. Uh, in terms of miscarriage, um, a uh, key thing for you to think about and make sure you're getting is um, a type and screen, uh, because if they are RH uh, negative with bleeding, you need to give Rogam, um, 50 uh, micrograms in the first trimester or 300 uh, later on. Um, this includes ectopic pregnancy. So if they're RH negative and had some form of bleeding, um, you're going to need to give Rogam. Complications that we're concerned about uh, in pregnancy um, help. So that's hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Um, and uh, hypertension in the later term, that's greater than 140 over 90. Uh, this is, again, later term saying greater than 20 weeks. Um, and up to six weeks postpartum can be diagnosed with preeclampsia, eclampsia. Um, symptoms are going to have that elevated BP, headache, visual disturbances, edema, abdominal pain. Um, you'll also find protein in the urine. Uh, eclampsia is when you have seizures associated with preeclampsia. And the key is large doses, like four grams of, magne of magnesium sulfate, controlling their uh, hypertension, uh, as well as emergent delivery if they're still pregnant. Uh, in third trimester bleeding, um, one of the main concerns is abruptio placentae, so a placental abruption. Um, vaginal bleeding with painful uterine contractions and feel distress are that classic tri triad, but the bleeding can be hidden. Um, you often see this in, the relation, in relation to some kind of trauma of some sort. Um, and you, if they are unstable, you want to deliver as soon as possible. Uh, placenta previa is when there is um, the placenta is partially or completely covering the os, and this can cause bleeding. Uh, in this case of placenta previa, we want to do no manual exams. It is contraindicated, and you need to do uh, use a sterile speculum if you're going to be doing an exam. Preterm labor starts prior to 37 weeks gestation. Um, that's 10 percent of deliveries. Um, if you have a rupture of membranes that is prior to 37 weeks, it's actually PPROM. Um, if you have rupture of membranes um, that's after 37 weeks, but before labor has started, that's just PROM. Again, uh, manual pelvic exam, uh, digital pelvic exam is contraindicated. And if you have to do exam, it's just a sterile speculum because they're at high risk for infection. All right, we're coming to the end here. Um, Moving on to psych and behavioral stuff, uh, in terms of alcohol, delirium tremens is one of obviously our major concerns with alcohol withdrawal. Uh, these are alcohol withdrawal symptoms with automatic instability as well as hallucinations. They're usually visual, delirium and possibly seizures. Um, benzos and you can add phenobarb, uh, phenobarb are gonna be key treatments. Related to alcohol use disorder, you're gonna have um, Korsakoff psychosis, which is an alcoholic amnestic disorder that is irreversible, again, related to thiamine deficiency. Meanwhile, Wernicke's encephalopathy, where you have altered mental status, um, nystagmus, or ophthalmoplegia, uh, ataxia, that is reversible. And uh, again, related to thiamine deficiency, so treatment is thiamine 500 milligrams IV. <clears throat> As we uh, know, delirium is different than dementia. Delirium is sudden, um, fluctuating, uh, while dementia is kind of an insidious, slowly kind of stable um, process that comes on. Um, often uh, there are visual hallucinations in delirium that's less common um, with dementia. Um, and the more depression side of this presentation, um, in psych suicide increases uh, with risk with age, prior attempts, if they're alone, uh, recently divorced, um, or have no social supports, unemployed. Um, when women often um, have more suicide attempts, um, but men are more successful. Um, obviously, if people need to be admitted involuntarily, that is often the best uh, thing for them in the long run. Um, in terms of homicidal ideation and homicide, um, there is no real confidentiality here. Um, 
we need to report uh, any one homicidal ideations or you know a homicide that we're aware of. Uh, Non-accidental trauma. Um, over 80% of the time, uh, the prime parent or, or the main parent or primary guardian is at fault. Uh, red flags that we're going to be seeing are delays in care, um, history doesn't make sense. We're seeing an obvious pattern like a hand or a belt um, or round kind of like cigarette butt burns. Um, we are seeing injuries and, and times of healing that don't make sense. For a non-ambulatory kid who has bruises in kind of non-bony places, especially, uh, those are all red flags. In shaken baby syndrome, you're also going to see uh, retinal uh, hemorrhages. Remember here that you're a mandated reporter, uh, and so that's going to be key thing for you to be doing on tests and in real life. Elderly um, abuse most commonly is neglect. Um, it is often also related to financial uh, reasons, but also can be physical, psychological. Um, if an uh, elderly person has decision-making capacity and they want to go home, for example, they can be discharged, but we should let adult protective services know. And in many states, we again are mandatory reporters. Um, conversion disorder is normally related to a psychiatric condition um, that's not intentionally produced. This is often sudden, unexplained, and sometimes related to an emotional stressor. That could be paralysis, dumbness, blindness. Um, for our purposes, remember that it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And so we are working to rule out all organic diseases before making any kind of thought of a conversion disorder. All right, renal and urogenital. Acute renal failure, um, which is defined as 50% decrease in creatinine clearance, 50% increase in your serum creatinine. Um, the most common is pre-renal, which is some decrease in renal flow, renal um, hypoperfusion, often instead of um, uh, ACE um, or NSAIDs, uh, decreased intravascular volume, uh, so hypovolemia, blood loss, sepsis. You're going to see that with your BN creatinine ratio, ratio that's um, elevated greater than 20. Intrinsic is commonly acute numular necrosis, tubular necrosis. That's 90% of the time, and that's pathology within the kidney. Your B or creatinine ratio is going to be less than 20. Post renal is going to be obstructive. Most common is um, uh, BPH. Um, you're going to have relatively normal labs, but on ultrasound, we're going to see a post void residual. With chronic renal failure, that's months to years. As we know, you don't really have symptoms until you have really significant dysfunction. Um, commonly diabetes, hypertension are causing it. Hyperkalemia is majorly life-threatening to these patients. Um, you're going to have a case uh, in real life and on the test um, where you have a cardiac arrest in the setting of someone with end-stage renal disease and hemodialysis. You're going to have to empirically treat for hyperkalemia and make sure you get that calcium ASAP as well as um, other hyper-K treatments. Vascular access problems. Uh, most common problems are stenosis or thrombosis. If there's thrombosis, there'll be no thrill or brewy, and you need some kind of vascular intervention, usually with fibrolinux or surgery. Bleeding, um, you have to apply direct pressure to the arterial uh, supply proximal to the AV fistula, or you can give DDAVP. Um, if there's an infection, most commonly it's staph aureus, um, and you're going to have to kind of treat for staph aureus gram negatives. Um, Venk is common, uh, but that's dosed kind of... Uh, with extra time as the half-life for VANC is pretty long. Um, peritoneal dialysis. Um, in uh, these patients, uh, most common problem is going to be infection. We're going to have abdominal pain, fever, pain during inflow. Um, remember, these patients are accessing kind of and doing their dialysis at home all the time. Remember that the criteria um, for saying that it's infected is different than SBP. And so you're going to be sending the peritoneal fluid. And what you'll see is um, you'll have greater than 100 WBCs and greater than 50% PMNs. Um, staph FB is the most common um, kind of infection. And you're going to have to make sure you're doing intraperitoneal um, antibiotics. <clears throat> Glomerulonephritis. Um, the way it is often tested is following a some kind of post-streptococcal infection. So that's a group based direct infection, usually pharyngitis, occasionally impetigo, but that's pretty rare. Most commonly, you'll see periorbital edema with some hypertension, um, hyper, uh, uh, hematuria. Um, you're going to find proteinuria and R, uh, RBC cas. Uh, remember the antibiotics here do not prevent this disease. Um, that's actually rheumatic fever in the sense of kind of a strep infection. 
urinary tract infections, um, 80 to 90% of the time it's E. coli. Um, we treat symptoms in healthy women, self-reporting, 90% do have a UTI. So again, we treat symptoms. Um, Luke esterase is highly sensitive for pyuria. Positive nitrates are pretty specific for nitrate reducing bacteria, again, especially E. coli. Um, simply kind of in the textbook, you're going to be treated with nitroferrin, and bactrim. You get more complicated. There's lots of other things, but classically augmenting chloroquinolones. Um, pyelonephritis obviously is when you add fever to that. Cystitis rarely presents with fever. So if someone has a fever, you start thinking about pyelonephritis associated with flank pain and CV aeterninus. Um, classically, you were thinking fluoroquinolone is an outpatient and ceftriaxone an inpatient. Now, in general, we know we usually want to give an IV dose of ceftriaxone before we do any, um, before we decide what we're going to give outpatient. Um, indications for admission are if they're toxic, if they're pregnant, or if they have significant comorbid morbid factors. Scrotal pain and swelling, most common for the boards are going to be epididymitis, uh, testicular torsion, or torsion of the testicular appendage, which we'll talk about more later. Um, hydrocele's transluminate with light. Um, varicoceles are that, quote, bag of worm, which is great um, kind of imagery there. Um, hernias are often indirect here if they're involving the scrotum, going through the inguinal canal into the scrotum. Um, so specifically epididymitis, if they're young, you think STIs. Um, but I would say if there's risky behaviors, even if they're older, you think STIs. Um, older patients, uh, we're thinking more um, E. coli and bacteria there. And so in terms of treatment, you treat for what you would uh, treat with GCCT for, for younger patients, fluoroquinolones for older patients. Uh, friend sign pain uh, improves when you elevate the scrotum, but that's not at all reliable clinically. Testicular torsion, uh, peak incident is at puberty, but it happens in all ages. Um, in testing, you're going to see this a lot with like a young kid who just won't stop crying and has abdominal pain. That's something you can think about. Um, acute unilateral pain and swelling. Uh, usually cream asteric is absent, but again, cream asteric and friends are both kind of unreliable. What's most important is that you just want to consult uh, and then do, do kind of ultrasound other studies. Um, classic is that you won't have access to your consultant, and so you will have to attempt some kind of manual detorsion, uh, which is that kind of open book medial to lateral rotation. Appendix testis torsion um, is in the same age group, but what's classic is the, quote, blue dot sign, which is what the arrow is pointing at, where you have a small bluish nodule on the upper pole, uh, and that's only present, though, in like 25%. But in this case, it's scroll support and NSAIDs. Corneas, we talked about necrotizing uh, fasciitis earlier. It's just necrotizing fasciitis of the groin, um, and so it's the same kind of antibiotics, and it's also polymicrobial. Urethritis um, is common, uh, most common urologic infection. Often um, in a sexually active male, it is that and not a UTI. You're going to see gonorrhea, chlamydia, you're treating for STIs. Um, Parafimosis uh, is a um, surgical emergency. And this is the case where you cannot reduce a retracted foreskin. Um, and because of that, it's causing ischemia. You're going to have a um, to try to manually reduce these people as soon as possible. Um, and if you need to, your logic consult, well, they may do something called a dorsal slit um, procedure. Phimosis is not necessarily an emergency, especially if they can urinate. Um, in this case, similar thing, you're going to uh, try some gentle retraction. Uh, priapism, um, the most common form is low flow. Um, and this is ischemic and painful. You think about a patient with sickle cell disease uh, for the, the test and often is the most common uh, reason people present is due to sickle cell disease. Um, high flow, it's increased arterial flow, um, and that's often related to trauma. Usually testing is with an ABG analysis and in low flow, it's ischemic, and so they're going to be uh, acidemic. Um, previously, sub was kind of what you would trial, but honestly, at this point, generally, we just try to aspirate um, with intraconversal aspiration, and sometimes you can irrigate with phenylephrine um, if aspiration alone doesn't work. Uh, for sickle cell patients, you may need to do an exchange transfusion. We talked about HUS a bit earlier, um, and so I won't kind of go over that again. Uh, kidney stones, um, urea splitting bacteria, usually uh, that's proteus, but that's often a struvite kidney stone. Most kidney stones are actually calcium oxalate. Um, in terms of passage, if it's less than about five millimeters, 90% of the time it will pass. Um, 
And as we all know, if there's an infected obstructed stone, that's a surgical emergency. They often need to be admitted and need urology. And my last slide um, is, uh, as we know how to diagnose a kidney stone, it's often sudden debilitating flank pain. However, when you hear that, you should also think of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, in terms of diagnosis, um, I didn't even know we used to do intravenous pylograms. That's obviously not something we're really doing anymore. Um, CT, um, especially for first stones, is what we can think of. However, for uh, people where we, we kind of know they've had stones before, um, we think about ultrasound instead. And there is no difference in uh, rate of missed high, uh, high risk diagnoses or complications with ultrasound versus CT. Hey, hey, do we need a break or you want to go straight into let's, it? Uh, let's keep going since we're running behind and we have to finish at 12. All right. I should be able to get done on time. You guys can take two minutes set up. Oh, you can see my slide, Denise? Um, yes. I don't know if it's just my screen, but it looks really zoomed in. How do I make it less zoomed in? You see a big picture of me? I think the slide looks normal to me. I think the picture on the slide is just like a very low, right? It's, fu it's a fuzzy it's picture. Very fuzzy. Okay. It's very fuzzy. It's from like the early 2000s. And is it so actually like, yeah, is like that 2000. You? That is Wait. me. Oh my God. Send that to us. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess, I mean, I want to give you guys like a two minute bio break, but. We can get started, Annie, because we've run all, right. all of them. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, this is IT jams. This is my Katz's jam session. Um, I actually dabbled in uh, drums when I was in ninth grade was my drum teacher. Um, and I realized very quickly that, um, yeah, I don't really have much rhythm. Um, so the only jams I'm going to be doing is really in, in uh, emergency medicine. And for the next hour, we're going to cover respiratory trauma, tox, and a little bit of P's resots. All right, so let's get started. All right, so in terms of the 